Budget Committee of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. On today's program, we are going to be receiving a briefing from the Financial and Fiscal Commission on the 2021-2022 submissions for the Division of Revenue. And members, regarding the briefing by the Provincial Treasury on their first quarterly departmental performance, as communicated to members previously, Provincial Treasury requested a postponement due to the first quarter provincial budget performance not having served before cabinet yet. And this is due to cabinet focusing on gender-based violence in their sitting on the 25th of August and the Friday's cabinet that was canceled. The proposed date um, is this, that this will then take place on the 20th of October, which is currently the only closest date available. Um, and that will also be when the budget committee is being briefed by the department on the Pero and Mero. And we also have today for consideration um, one set of minutes. Members, um, just a reminder of the rules of engagement. Please note that um, we are on YouTube and the meeting is recorded. Further, the, for the presenters, if you have a presentation, you're welcome to put the presentation up. You're also welcome to put on your video and your mic, both presenters and those um, members who would like to ask questions. If um, you are asking a question or if you are engaging um, or on the floor, and I just ask that you please put your mic and your video off once you have concluded your engagement or your question. Please use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question or pose a point of order. And if we can also please just keep the chat function clear so that we can um, deal with any technical details in the chat function. Uh, members, I'm going to ask that you first introduce yourselves um, and then that the department introduces its, uh, uh, the FFC introduces itself and then we can jump straight into the presentation. Um, I also just want to note that I received one apology from Honourable Philander and that Honourable Allen um, is standing in for her. Members, if you could introduce yourselves, please. Good morning, Ricardo McKenzie. Thank good you, morning, McKenzie. Good morning, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, Chairperson. It's Lulama, a member of the committee, but at the same time, may I just indicate that Honorable Ngondo is going to join us late uh, because she has to go to another star's women's meeting. No problem. Thank you, Honorable Mvimbi. And I think I heard Honorable Branca is there as well. Good, yes, good uh, morning, Chairperson. Uh, Brankes, thank you. Good thank morning, you. Chairperson. Good morning to, to the members. As you noted earlier, Chair, um, I'm Regan Allen and I'm Standing in for member Wendy Philander. Thank you, Honorable Allen. Good morning, Chair. I'm Dalen Mitchell. I'm an alternate member of this committee. Um, yeah. Thank you, Honorable Mitchell. Good morning, Chairperson. This is Gillian Bosman. I'm also an alternate joining this morning. Thank you, Honorable Bosman. Are there any other members joining us today? Morning, morning, Chair. Um, oh. I've, ju I've just joined. Uh, thank you, com um, 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 uh, Member Mvimbi. Uh, I was able to be released uh, on time in the SARS uh, uh, event. Thank you very much. Uh, mo morning, um, uh, Chairperson and the members. I'm Nomin Kondlo, member of the committee. Welcome, Honorable Mkondlo. I'm now going to hand over to the FFC. Professor Plykis, if you could just um, introduce your team to us, please. Good morning, Chairperson, Honourable Members. Um, can I ask, my name is Daniel Plykis, I'm the Chairperson of the Finance and Fiscal Commission. Um, I don't know who has joined uh, the, the meeting as yet. I can see some of the names. Can I ask, with your permission, that, that the commissioners that's in this meeting quickly introduce themselves? And then also, with your permission, that the the three lead researchers on this report also introduce themselves, please. No problem, Professor Plykis. Um, if the commissioners and the researchers um, with us today could just please introduce themselves. Good 
Michael Sachs, are you in the meeting? I see it. <laughs> I also have a list of names here that I received. Would you like me to read them out and see see who's here and who's still joining? Yeah, that would be great. Number of that's still. That would be great, Honorable Chairperson. Also, just noting it's storming in Cape Town, so I don't know whether people from far-lying places are able to connect. No problem. Okay. The names I received for the FFC, obviously, is Professor Plykes, who's the chairperson. I received Professor Michael Sachs, who's the deputy chairperson. Uh, <laughs> Professor Lawrence Jacobus Erasmus, who's a commissioner. Uh, Mr. Sikumbuzo. Eric Kolwane, who's a commissioner, Ms. Ntabeleng Mocho Choko, who's a commissioner, Professor Aubrey Mokadi, who's a commissioner, Ms. Mandla Mkomfe, commissioner, Ms. Elizabeth Rockman, commissioner, and Henry Eckstein, parliamentary liaison, stakeholder manager, office of chairperson. Uh, I'm assuming that person is also a, a mister because I don't um, have a title for the person here. Um, if anyone else is on the line, you're obviously welcome to introduce yourselves. My name is Tim Sang. I'm the special office of the chairperson. I'm one of the presenters today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to present themselves quickly? Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sasha Peters. Um, I'm also part of the research unit at the FFC and will be presenting today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chair. My name is Eddie Rakabe. I'm also part of the researchers uh, at the FFC. I'll also be giving a presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, Chairperson and members of the committees. Uh, my name is Kay. That's my full name, Kay Brown, simple name and surname. And I'm the CE of the FFC. Thank you, Ms. Brown, Kay, full name Kay. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, um, Professor Plykis, I'm then going to hand over to you. Yeah, I see, uh, thank you very much. I see Commissioner uh, Kowani there, and I don't know whether he can actually hear us. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Kowani, are you with us today? I see you on the, on the list of participants. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Well, I think... Chairperson, if you don't mind, we probably need to proceed. You'll see that some of our commissioners come in and out, and it's got to do with the connections that they have. Because I saw Michael Sachs, the deputy chair, coming in, and then he left again. Uh, I think it's got to do with the connection to Cape Town and uh, uh, four seasons in one day. It's actually raining outside, it's storming. So let's deal with this before the storm gets worse. Can no I stop? Problem. You may go ahead. I'm just going to put my video off for connectivity reasons, um, but I am here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson and Honourable Members. Um, we, we're doing this presentation in terms of the constitutional law requirements that every year uh, by May we table with the Minister of Finance and the Cabinet and Parliament a Division of Revenue uh, recommendations for the next year. Um, that same requirement is also uh, that we do the same with provincial legislatures and with the Association for South African Local Government. This year's presentation that we do to you is effectively looking at sustainable financing of social and economic infrastructure and services. We've chosen this theme to be able to reflect on South Africa's growing social and economic service delivery obligations to be sustainable financing uh, within the context of deteriorating socioeconomic and macroeconomic conditions, and in particular weakening fiscal position. So one of the main messages that we would like to put to you is that we, even if we find ourselves in this difficulty, we need to ensure that we sustain the financing of economic and social infrastructure. We've identified some for you in this report. 
but also noting that if we don't do that, we will create serious problems on access, quality, and the value of services that gets delivered. Chair, we're also more specifically focusing preliminary for this report because we're going to go much more in depth um, um, in terms of next year's report and also reports that we're doing for this year, is that we're looking at the economic and social development in the context of COVID. We then follow through on sustainable financing on public health and NHI, looking at the challenges there and the, and the legislative shortcomings on the one hand, but also what are the things that need to be done. Let me put up front that the Finance and Fiscal Commission supports fully the introduction of a national health insurance scheme, and, uh, and we think it's long overdue. But there are some structural and functional issues that need to be addressed in terms of the, the national legislation that sets the framework, but more importantly, how the, how the service delivery networks is going to connect with each other. We also look at quality and inclusive social services. And there, in particular, we're focusing on the most vulnerable, um, on children between the age of zero to nine and services between the, the children age of zero to nine. And as you know, it's about child, early childhood development. Um, some of us that has not attended uh, early childhood services the way we know it, some people call it crash, some people call it early childhood playgroups. Um, you will know that one of the critical issues of early childhood and community groups um, uh, for a person of like like me who come was originally from, was originally from Bontyville, um, early childhood was always about safety first, safety and security of children first. So we're looking at some of those things and we we advising that there needs to be innovations uh, around protection of early of children between the age of zero to nine. We're also looking at inclusive education. Um, uh, again, for our children um, within within the country, and we then we start looking at welfare services. Um, and we have seen that uh, there's been a, a a material decline in terms of the provision of welfare services. And those programs that we talk about every time when there's a crisis happening in the country, um, either a shooting or murder or drug dependency, then we call on welfare services. But you yourselves as legislators has not properly looked at how welfare services gets financed. So there's an onus and the responsibility that we're coming to tell you that you are also as a collective responsible to make sure that we properly look at the vulnerable in our society and not just we just not just talk about it. Then there's also the issue of of we starting to look then at the the problematic of the intergovernmental fiscal decentralization system within the country and how that affects social services. So hopefully at the end, we would have been able to convince you that going forward, given the context that we find ourselves economically with the deteriorating fiscal space, public finance spending, you would make sure that you keep a quite a tight look at monitoring um, how social services gets financed within the Western Cape province, and that money goes in, indeed to the to the vulnerable. So that's quite a new challenge that we're putting to yourselves and and other provincial legislatures, and then we don't just run out and cry that our children has been affected by us not actually making sure that the finance flow in that direction. With that, Chairperson, can I hand over to to Eric Rakabe? Sorry, Eddie Rakabe. And then following that, uh, Chen Cheng, and then um, um, Sasa Peters. Um, and then I'm also asking you that uh, you allow the flow to go. Um, they know exactly when to present with your permission. Um, and then we can get quicker through the presentation and chasing you through the uh, fast tracking to the report. Can I also just say very importantly, We've experienced that that over the years, since I've been chairperson in the last two years, that 
parliamentarians, whether they sit in national or provincial legislature, see the side presentation as a substitute to the content of the report. I'm appealing to you in a, in a difficult environment. This is not a replacement of the report. It is just to help you through the report. And I'm asking your, your, your members, chairperson, to read through the report. And also ask your officials to read through the report in provincial government departments, because they don't read the report. Um, and then every year we get asked the same questions. And then you can also test them whether they've actually read the report and see whether they applied our recommendations to the reports. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Professor Parikis. Um, please do um, allow your officials to run through the presentation um, after each other. And um, I'm sure that the members have heard the message. They must ensure that their bedside reading is well stocked with the Financial and Fiscal Commission information. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I'm asking Eddie, I see our Deputy Chairperson is here. Um, Apology, um, Professor Plykes. Um, I just I see a hand um, from Honourable Mackenzie quickly. I just want to take that quickly. Honourable Mackenzie, is it a point of order? No, Chair. I just want to get clarity from you. Are we going to uh, save all the the questions until the end of the meeting, um, until the the full presentation is done? Yes, Honourable Mackenzie, I would. Pre Please, if we can just please keep all the questions for the end of the meeting, because then we can run through them um, for the F Financial and Fiscal Commission. Perhaps just jot down the person presenting so that you know who you would like to ask a question to. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think, think Honourable McKenzie probably wants to ask you in which streets of Bontemil am I coming from? In Nederig Road, just to get it out of the way. Nederig <laughs> Road. Okay. Um, can I can I ask uh, Eddie to take us through the presentation first, Chairperson? And I'm going to switch off my camera and my mic. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, my name is Eddie. I'm going to take you through the uh, next few set of slides, just to start with the context within which we table the submission. Really, it's just to indicate that uh, we, we this this submission is tabled in a very difficult situation uh, economically that we find ourselves in. So as we may have seen, uh, so the projections that have been made lately by the likes of the IMF and the, and the World Bank projects that the economy is going to contract by about 8% on average. And, and if you look at some of the statistics that came out this week, already indicating that the third quarter GDP is likely to uh, contact by as much as 40%, which is still the pro projection. And that would mean that the economy would have been in contraction straight for four, for four consecutive uh, quarters. Uh, that really means that we we find ourselves in a, in, a, in a deep recession, really. So in, the implication, of course, is that we're going to need unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy intervention in order to boost the, the, the economy out of this uh, uh, morass. Uh, next slide, please. The the second slide speaks to the implication, of course, of that contraction. With contraction, it, mean, it means that uh, uh, in terms of fiscal policy, we're going to experience uh, a serious deficit. As we've already seen with the budget that has been tabled, the supplementary budget that was tabled by the Minister of Finance recently in June, uh, the, the deficit was actually much higher. But what is even more of a concern is that our deficit reduction and debt stabilization tar targets has been rather elusive. So we've not been able to meet our <coughs> deficit, <coughs> sorry, deficit, re deficit reduction uh, targets. And that really it, it says a lot about the credibility of our, of our budget. And of course, that has got implication going forward for the debt service cost and the amount of money that eventually goes to the provinces and municipality from, from the fiscal transfer. So it's very important going forward that the debt is stabilized. Even with the contraction, the debt has got, has got to, we've got to find a way to stabilize uh, the debt. And I think there are a number of measures which the Minister of Finance have already spoken to, including reprioritization, but also making sure that there's value for money when government is spending so that we don't have to go outside to borrow uh, for, 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 for useless things. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide really just shows the, the, the importance of public expenditure and and how it's going to be important in order for the for the economy to recover from the from the current contraction. As you can see, 
we've had a very good run from 2016. The expenditure was growing fairly, fairly, <coughs> fairly well, even despite the fact that the economy was not growing at a very good rate. So we've had the economy growing at less than, at less than two percent, but still, we would still be uh, a public expenditure was 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 rising uh, steadily. But now with the COVID-19, we, 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 we're starting to see that the expenditure, uh, total expenditure will decline uh, 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 in 2021 and in 2022. So, and with that decline, obviously we're going to have to, uh, we have to, go, uh, government has got to boost spending in order to boost economy, economic growth. Now the, 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 the difficult situation that we find ourselves is that with the, the narrow fiscal, narrow, narrow fiscal space and the contraction, where then that does the public expenditure is going to come from? And I think that's the most important thing here is that government has not now has to provide an enabling environment for growth. Instead of just focusing on, on increasing spending, also there's a need to now focus on a, a, a providing an enabling environment so that the economy the economy grows and as a, and, and, and subsequently there will be resources or, uh, to finance a social spending. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide just to, is just to give the context, uh, the socio-economic context within the Western Cape provincial province. Province. Really, I think the indication here is that uh, Western Cape has got the second highest population growth after uh, Gauteng. And when you look at uh, poverty head count, uh, Western Cape has, has again has got the second lowest poverty head count uh, after 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 Gauteng. So the province, in terms of socio-economic conditions, seem to be doing uh, doing. Uh, very well uh, comparatively to other provinces in it although poverty levels of course are still very high across the country but uh, when you look at uh, the western cape the situation seems to be much better uh, uh, next slide please uh, the next slide focus on the uh, the provincial contribution to gdp and unemployment again as you can see uh, i suppose this is, a, is, a, is, a, is quite a known fact that uh, northern cape kzn and 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 and, 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 and kwazulu natal combined cons contribute more than 63% uh, of gdp and also in, and, and also in, in terms of employment they i think northern um, western cape has got the lowest uh, 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 unemployment rate relative to the other provinces so uh, the socio-economic indicators really indicate that the province is is uh, is is doing much better when compared to the uh, the rest of the other provinces. Is that of course doesn't mean that there there mustn't be intervention to address the the the, the unemployment rate. Uh, it's just 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 a comparative analysis. And uh, next slide. Uh, the next slide again here is looking looking at the service access and service quality, starting with uh, the healthcare. Broadly, we look at maternal mortality and infant infant mortality. And when you look at uh, uh, Western Cape again, the uh, in terms of maternity is, is well below the national average of about 110 per per 100,000 deaths. So there is something that is probably the healthcare system is able to, to do. It's still very high by international standards, but uh, comparatively with the rest of the country is, is a little bit low. And, the, and, and it is still the same with the, with the infant mortality. Of course, I mean, it's, it's really a concern that we, we continue to see these uh, big numbers in terms of infant mortality. Uh, uh, it means that there's something wrong with the health, with our healthcare system that needs to be that needs to be improved. So when you look at the uh, infant uh, infant uh, mortality for Western Cape is, is around uh, 17.3 per 1,000 uh, life birth, life birth. So uh, again, uh, but that's still uh, well uh, uh, above uh, provinces like Eastern Cape. So there isn't really. Uh, uh, I would say an argument to say that urban, more urban provinces are doing much better than the rural provinces. I think it's just a matter of healthcare performance and and how the healthcare system is able to deal with some of the some of the uh, socio-economic conditions and how they affect the health the health of the population uh, at in, in, at large. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide deal with the education access and 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 in particular focusing on ECD, as the, uh, the chair has already mentioned, that it's quite important uh, to, to really focus on the, 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 <clears throat> the development of the children, as that has got you know, implications for the future development, for future development. So in terms of ECD, when you look at the, Eastern, uh, the Western Cape in particular, you find that the, 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 the about 48% of the, of, of the children do not attend any, any, any childcare facilities. 
and any and just any, any ACD facility. So that is again a, a big concern. Forty-eight point four percent is big, is, a, is a big concern, and only twenty-two percent uh, are, able, are able to attend ECD or education educa centers. So again, that's really a big concern because it means that people, uh, the, 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 our kids will go to uh, to grade one without having attended uh, the we had without having attended early child care development and of, of course that has got implication for their development where as and as they progress uh, uh, towards in i mean within the education system now looking at matriculation pass rate uh there i think the the province where western cape has got most uh, the a third uh, uh, highest uh, 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 matriculation pass rate. There is always arguable whether must, uh, matriculation pass rate is a good indicator of education system. And as you'll see in our presentation, is that uh, perhaps we were missing on some of the uh, the, the good or, or the requisite indicators of education because we're not measuring the performance of the system in its totality by just only looking at matriculation pass rate. But because this is the data that is mostly readily available, it seems where uh, well, the, the country as a whole is doing well, when well above 70% of matriculation pass rate, and in particular, Western Cape doing well at 82%. At 82%. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide, uh, uh, honorable members and chairperson, uh, deals with the South Africa. Uh, uh, it's really the, the, the meat of the submission that the, the, the commission is tabling to the provincial legislature. And the first chapter deal with the intergovernmental fiscal system in the context of social services. So it's essentially the, the, the idea behind this chapter is really to, to just indicate that if the systems, if the intergovernmental system that is underlying the service delivery arrangement is not working well, the government will not be able to deliver services. And as a result, we contribute to, to experience poor quality uh, 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 service outcomes, as I have indicated in in some of the, in some of the slides. So uh, briefly, the chapter looks at the ass assessment factors that affect uh, effective function of intergovernmental fiscal relation for social services, uh, with particular emphasis on governance, uh, delivery, and funding challenges. So we, so we focus on legislative and the institutional framework underpinning intergovernmental fiscal relations. I will also review the education and health performance data available for measuring outputs and outcome. As I said, matriculation uh, result is not necessarily an, <coughs> it's not a sufficient measure of the of the education system as a whole in totality. So we look at the the, the extent to which there is education and health performance data available to measure the, the system performance as a whole. And then we also assess the feasibility of implementing the costed norms uh, to improve the linkage between the allocation and expenditure responsibility. So basically, the costed norms is a formula uh, which was uh, proposed by the Commission in 2001 to, to replace the current provincial equitable share formula. The reason being that we, the Commission wanted to provide a much better linkage between the input pro requires to, to, to deliver certain level of services and allocations that are given to the provinces. So, but at that time, there was not really sufficient data to, to enable uh, application of that formula. So it was now rejected. But then we thought that it, now it's an opportune time to now look at whether that system cannot be brought in, in place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next slide really is just to, uh, it's just the, 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 the key questions that we were asking in this study. Firstly, that uh, what are the legislative and institutional hindrances to the effective functioning of intergovernmental fiscal relations system? Uh, what remains to be done in the system of education and health performance management system, and lastly, whether it's feasible to implement the costed norms as I've just mentioned. Next slide. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Here, just to give you, just to give the member, uh, honourable members, the, uh, the brief findings from this chapter is that uh, the lack of clarity on the division of responsibility for concurrent functions uh, create the uh, tensions in the delivery of social services. Of course, the constitution says that uh, health and education are a concurrent functions between provinces and national government, but there are certain sub-functions, such certain functions within each uh, a function, which we find that sometimes are not clearly defined. And as a result, there's also always tensions about who must fund a certain services or who is accountable for a certain uh, delivery outcomes. And that, if not, if it's not clarified, we find that they, they often create tensions and obviously it, it, it uh, contributes to poor uh, delivery outcomes. Secondly, is that intergovernmental relations 
structures to foster coordination, good governance, and improve to improve delivery are effective. So there, there are certain forums which the 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 the, the legislation such as the Intergovernmental Fiscal Relations Act, so the Health Act and the Education Act all provides for, but we find that those forums are not necessarily uh, effective to, 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 uh, to facilitate consensus between provinces and national government. And as a result, it then contributes to these tensions that we've spoken about on, on the deliver of concurrent functions. And the third is that the absence of standard methodology to estimate provincial expenditure needs uh, uh, exacerbate perceptions of fiscal imbalance and budget gaming. So here, basic, basically, is that if we don't know what it costs to, pro, to the cost of providing education or the cost of providing healthcare, because there is no a, a, a standard methodology for estimating expenditure needs, it's therefore difficult for any province to say that they are underfunded. Or even for a national government to say a service, a service, a particular service is adequately funded. So, it, it, so that's why we say this uh, the lack of standard methodology exacerbates perceptions of fiscal imbalances and also budget gaming. In some cases, we have find that there is uh, budget gaming which is being done by by provinces. The, 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 <coughs> the third point is that there's a lack of norms of standard. Sorry, can you just go back? Yeah, the lack of norms of standard leads to variation in allocations and service quality across provinces and causes intergovernmental fiscal disputes. So the, the, the figures that are presented earlier around education and healthcare actually indicate this variation in, in service level and service quality. And that's because there is not, we don't really have sufficient uh, norms and standards to against which we can measure the performance of any performance, uh, the performance of any provinces against against uh, set, the clearly set out delivery norms, so that we we uh, it, we, we 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 find it it causes intergovernmental fiscal disputes. Uh, next slide. Yeah, the next slide speak about the, uh, the the next finding really is is really around the availability of data to enable systematic and holistic evaluation of social services performance. So in this case, we find that there is insufficient credible data to enable a government as a whole to measure the performance of the education and health and health system as a as a whole. So the 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 in the in our in the study that we did, we found that by international standards, South Africa has about 44% of the capacity required to measure education performance and only 32% of that needed to measure healthcare performance. And lastly, is that the current provincial equitable share formula is uh, relatively allocative, inefficient, but uh, it could be improved uh, by incorporating certain aspects of the costed norms, which I spoke to at the beginning. So, so we find that the, the, there is data available currently to differentiate population by gender uh, and poverty profile, which are the factors that affect service demand and cost of providing such services. Of course, in other provinces like Northern Cape, they, they, they may raise the issue of topography, they may raise the issue of the size of the terrain. That uh, we, we find with current developments on data collection, uh, certain aspects of that model can be incorporated to improve uh, its responsiveness and making sure that uh, it provides a better linkage between inputs and the outputs. The inputs required to produce uh, uh, services and the output which uh, provinces are supposed to, to deliver. Uh, next slide. Uh, this table really is just to indicate some of the data gaps that I've spoken to in the case of healthcare. Uh, I wouldn't go too much into details, but also if you go into the report itself, there's a whole number of of of, of, the, of tables that shows where these data gaps are and what needs to what type of data do we do we need to collect in order to be able to 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 assess the performance of the education and health performance system, but also also improve accountability. Because if you have performance information, then you're able to hold the executive up available. Without such information, there's really no basis for, again, against which the, the legislature would be able to measure the performance of the, of the, of the, of the, of the executive. Uh, next slide, just on, on the recommendations, I'll be very brief on them. I'll speak to the first two recommendations and, and I'll allow the members to, to read through the rest. Uh, the, the first recommendation really is that the national departments responsible for the national departments responsible for key concurrent social functions, especially education, health, and health, must revise their respective enabling or subordinate legislations to ensure that uh, the roles and responsibility for various sub-functions or activities within function are clearly detailed 
and link to the accountability framework. framework. Uh, the second one is that, uh, sorry, the second one is that the national and health education sector uh, departments uh, responsible for operationalizing intergovernmental relations must invest in financial and human resource capacities to conduct uh, intergovernmental relations consciously and also emphasize the values of trust and cooperative governance. Uh, in the interest of time, Chairperson, let me hand over to my colleague Chen to continue with Chapter 3 uh, and 4. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter 3 uh, it, of, the annual of our annual submission is titled Economic and Social Development in the Context of COVID-19. Indeed, uh, this COVID-19 uh, came at a heartbeat um, and uh, the shock is unprecedented in many ways. Uh, so, so here in this chapter, the goal um, is ultimately to stimulate a new discourse for a cogent recovery plan uh, to try and see through the veil and or to see through the chaos that is currently uh, in place uh, to invigorate the development by way of understanding where we came from, uh, what were our social, economic and financial and fiscal standings as we are now facing the COVID-19 shock. So we examine the market context um, as a backdrop to understanding the, this impact of COVID-19. Um, the public health crisis uh, on South Africa. For financial and fiscal context, the, con uh, the chapter considers the fiscal implications uh, to inform reprioritization and fiscal path uh, forward, as uh, while well, immediately it's uh, the MDBBS that is coming our way. Then with these, uh, in the chapter, the third section, if you like, uh, we argue that South Africa should embark on a localized product value chain approach of development and emphasize the need for basic municipal uh, services of water, electricity, and sanitation, all with, enveloped in the context of agriculture, we think being um, the, the, the sort of exemplar industry to look at. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, without some sort of a local uh, of these basic services of water, electricity, and sanitation, in fact, None of the, any uh, any industries uh, can't grow uh, without these uh, services. Um, next, I move right. So this graph uh, shows the history um, where we came from of South Africa's economic performance since 1960. The green line and labels are showing uh, the annual change indicates that the COVID-19 pandemic impact is anticipated to cause the most significant economic downturn since the start of the data series. But more importantly is the long run GDP growth, which is that red line um, and uh, labels, uh, which shows the structural decay you see, especially that started uh, roughly around the financial crisis. Um, and it just consistent decline uh, over uh, the, the past few years uh, due to governance failures, uh, institutional failures, uh, credibility failures, and uh, various other uncertainties uh, of policies. So, in particular, the impact of COVID-19 has had devastating shock on the economy and highlighted especially our structural inequality as, as uh, the structural uh, fragilities as signs of that um, and, and in our society that still persists. The uh, Commission identified two main routes under, underlying the high levels of joblessness and inequality in South Africa. Uh, first is this apartheid rule that had left the country without inclusive labor absorbent industries and ease of capital for developments. Um, we're always saying here is actually that we need to recognize that unlike other economies uh, in history, in fact, which progressed uh, through the stages of inclusive industrial development and involved most of its working age population across the spe uh, skills uh, spectrum, we, in South Africa, we did not have that. We, our industries, um, sectors basically matured and industrialized without uh, sharing the benefits with uh, many people. So as a result, even this post-94, industries were unable to generate that inclusivity uh, on a large scale. And, and, and of course, compounding that is the, the issue that the policy, the government interventions weren't able, uh, didn't seem to have failed in bringing about that inclusivity. Relating to the first then, also the second point is that 
this uh, over the uh, since '94, there has been an increasing dependency on it, this addiction uh, to, on this sort of commodity-based concentrated industries uh, development, and especially in the uh, around 2010. Our, our competitive industries were found in the concentrated m uh, markets of uh, mining. This is also referred to in the economic literature as the resource curse, which we observed in uh, many other African countries or developing countries. And uh, that this addiction to import solutions or products and capital as opposed to, uh, as opposed to innovate internally uh, to, to diversify local production for domestic inclusive uh, growth. Um, and in that vein also, uh, uh, FDI actually should, uh, is, is a form of that imports of capital uh, that needs to be paid back at some point. Hence, with COVID-19, <clears throat> as we are facing it now, South Africa's response to this pandemic can either to try and return uh, to these business as usual uh, modus operandi, which really no longer exists or applies, or to grasp the reality as we advise um, and the opportunity to leverage the crisis and effects structural change in real terms uh, in the economy. Uh, this, is, this is meant to be done through industrial diversification urgently, localized product value chain approach. As a proof of the need for structural change, uh, we look at the this inflation or the general increase in price for essential and non-essential items or core versus non-core inflation. Um, the, the best, we often say the best way to understand the market is through the pricing uh, dynamics of the, of the goods that you want to procure. With the data points uh, up to April this year, um, headline inflation was dropped down to 3%. Of course, in May also dropped lower, although recently there was a slight recovery. But the point here is that Despite this headline inflation drop, if you separate that time series into core and non-core, essentially the, those of essential items, right? Food, alcohol, non-alcoholic beverages, clothing, footwear, things that you need uh, on a daily basis to survive versus the other sort of non-core luxury items, sometimes we can say, we see that divergence. Um, that uh, the non-core inflation is actually remained relatively high compared to the headline and the and, and the non-core. So this actually just shows that structurally there are certain changes in the, in in the in the structure. So COVID, with COVID nineteen, what this means is that there is not only just the income effects, right? Uh, people losing jobs, losing income, uh, and therefore cannot consume. But also there is the price effect. Right, there's the affordability question then uh, for essential goods and services that, 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 is, uh, that is brought to the fore here. So with these significance, albeit uh, the, the brief overview of the economic and financial environments in the context of COVID, the commission observes as a despite masses of agricultural land, only single digit percentages of that land is under irrigation or crop farming. In the spirit of industrial diversification, the high levels of irradiation uh, could also offer an enormous opportunity for renewable energy for industrial growth in local rural areas um, with the potential to be competitive uh, and advantageous internationally. So in some, uh, basically we're arguing that the, uh, we argue that agriculture could be key to domestic food security and holds great potential for local economic development and industrial diversification by example. Um, so the recommendations of, uh, of this chapter is that first, there are only three. Um, first is that the Minister of Finance should develop and execute a clear and coherent comprehensive macroeconomic framework that is in line with the president's economic and social support response package to COVID-19. Um, and this we also bring to light, uh, bring to focus the issue, well, not issue, but uh, basically the position paper that was taken, right? Um, so all we're saying here, though, in, in terms of what this recommendation is trying to achieve is that the government should, should really take heed and focus on strengthening this continuity of policy, consistency of, of, uh, of policy. If we say we're going to do something, we do it. Uh, follow it through to retain and to maintain that credibility 
um, uh, of that economic and fiscal stance. And this is important that it should also be, uh, be pronounced and executed here going forward as per, uh, in terms of the money bills. Second, and that is important for the credibility of, uh, of fiscal policy or any policy that actually the government should be doing. And second is that after reviewing the economic situation, albeit brief, as I said, uh, that leading up to the COVID-19 crisis, the commission is convinced that, that a fundamental structural transformation of the economy is absolutely inevitable. Therefore, the ministers of finance, economic development, trade and industry and of labor I should jointly address the economic barriers, social inequality and societal polarization by adopting this localized product value chain approach. Uh, we, will, we will elaborate on that. I uh, should members uh, feel, feel the need to, to, uh, to hone in on some of the specifics. Um, and third is that the Commission argues that with the rights infrastructure and financial support from the states, emerging farmers can be catalysts uh, for local economic development and growth with the added benefits of food security in facing the COVID-19 crisis. We're saying here yeah, essentially that innovate within, find local solutions and um, and 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 in, and be creative in in uh, in solving this issue. And with the added benefits of also diversifying our um, our rather concentrated uh, economy and uh, production structure. So that is chapter three. Chapter four, moving on, is to uh, focus on the uh, the public health sector in terms of sustainable financing and the issue around the NHI. So the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, one thing to notice is that it is unbiased, or to realize it's a, it is unbiased as it stunned the healthcare system across the globe, irrespective of the country's income, wealth, socioeconomic status, and even financing structure. And our, our system, health system, in particular, is amongst the uh, vulner most vulnerable, given our not just the health system itself, but also the, the background, the backdrop of this extreme socioeconomic inequality and this two-tier system between the private and the public. Um, so faced with this unprecedented challenge of COVID-19, the need has never been greater for examining the financial, fiscal, structural and legislative requirements for ensuring the sustainable and affordable universal uh, access to quality healthcare services. What that means here is that, and we quote here, we identify the issue here as the, the study done by also Competition Commission in the Health Market Inquiry uh, that was published last year, that private healthcare in South Africa is characterized by high costs uh, due to misalignment of pricing and coverage relative to demand, resulting in barriers uh, to access. So the chapter is motivated in two fronts. One is that uh, the first part is a technical empirical pricing and costing exercise that, uh, that earlier you heard colleague uh, Eddie say about uh, uh, the cost and norms approach. Uh, to analyze the pricing of the three major healthcare packages, the primary healthcare package as uh, defined uh, in, uh, by the National Health Department, um, in some annex B, um, and prescribe minimum benefits as per the, uh, the Medical Aid Scheme Act um, for the private sector. And the proposal, well, mainly for the private sector, but also for some of the public sector. Um, uh, well, the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, medical scheme. And then the proposed demand, this is the, th the third one, is our proposed uh, demand-based, we call it the Pareto Healthcare Package, uh, which we use um, to estimate uh, the, the what could be the most optimal in terms of demand uh, and uh, pricing uh, of healthcare package in order to assess that value of this uh, healthcare service that is being covered in this in the market. So basically, the financial data sets and patient outputs data sets were merged at the sub-departmental uh, level of the hospital servicing units to derive the healthcare output cost mapping. The second part is to examine the NHI uh, reform in the context of the legislative and intergovernmental fiscal requirements and discusses four critical success factors or issues that are needed to achieve the unification of healthcare across, uh, access across the NHI. The table 
for the first part, the, the, the pricing and costing of the healthcare packages is here. Summarize uh, the costing, uh, the, the results are significant as according to the healthcare output cost mapping uh, that were derived using real data. The PHC, the primary healthcare uh, package, is estimated to cost at 2,198 rand, covering only though 27.3% of the healthcare service exposure. So, in other words, if, any, if a patient walks in there into um, a facility requiring medical attention, and then he carries around with him about 2,200 rands, um, he is, he could basically he's in a sense covered financially uh, for that 27.3% of the potential uh, need uh, and for uh, healthcare services. As, as his risk exposure to um, to treatment. The prescribed minimum benefit, that is as per the uh, Medical Aid Scheme Act, uh, and, and basically our discoveries and, and all the other uh, medical aid schemes um, for, for in the private sector is nearly 10 times that, costing almost, well, 20,000 uh, rand. Um, but with that uh, financial resource, uh, it's also covering 80.6% of the health service exposure and needs. However, if now then one uses uh, this uh, uh, costing mapping and just target those uh, sub-departments with the most patients and uh, or the demand uh, for exposure and sum up and derive the need this the need-based Pareto healthcare package, the third one we're proposing, one could cover at 80%, just almost as as much as the private sector, but only costing about uh, 13,000 rand. And we list uh, we list there all the um, the specifics of the of the sub departments. Essentially, those are the departments that you should see with the highest demand uh, for treatments. Of course, with the data, it, uh, it could very well change. Um, updates. Uh, so, through this costing and pricing analysis, the Commission found that the current PHC, so through this exercise, we also found other things uh, in terms of um, the structure of the PHC package, and that it only covers relatively, as you saw, very little. Um, and that we also noticed that um, it focuses too much of its resources and attention on the sort of the non-care services, such as information, promotion, screening, facilitation, and education purposes, and it only really manages uh, the minor ailments. Most cases that require more sophisticated laboratory testing and medical treatment needs uh, to be conducted at hospitals uh, through the referral system. So this issue, especially in the con current context uh, of COVID-19 pandemic, is uh, pertinent, right? As many of these small scales uh, APHC clinics are not equipped or capacitated enough to deal with a viral outbreak such as COVID-19 and thus potentially become points of contagion if not managed well uh, to increase the effect. It could be uh, potentially disastrous. And so this is also why I think um, many of the testing centers actually are conducted at uh, major primary uh, hospitals rather than at clinics. Um, so this so, so we're here advising that the, through this costing and pricing exercises we have demonstrated here could also be the gateway into understanding some of the structural deficiencies of the um, of, of some of the policy issues, um, and then also we motivate and um, uh, substantiate then that through this costing and pricing we also able to bring in the importance of uh, using data informed uh, to derive approach to derive uh, po better policies. Moving on then uh, to the NHI implementation, the Commission examined the 2019 NHI bill and advises four critical success factors. Um, align policy, the first one, the align policy and legislative framework, and second, determine the funding requirements and funding sources for NHI. Third, defined a comprehensive benefits for NHI beneficiaries, and fourth, capacitated and consistent IGR arrangements. I invite um, the honourable chair members to look at uh, the, our actual reports, as the our legalistic analysis into the, the NHI bill is quite in depth. However, if I may just uh, uh, highlight for you 
And in terms of the fourth a critical success factor and in terms of the management and control of hospitals and management of control and control of district health services uh, by way of uh, showing you the current setup. So the current funding flows as uh, as we know it is that basically money flows from National uh, Revenue Fund through appropriations to the Department of Health and through uh, conditional grants and then if, if, if it's through the equitable share, it's um, via the uh, more of the divisional revenue um, to provincial revenue fund. And that then goes to the provincial department of health uh, and then uh, to the um, ultimately the facilities on the ground for primary health care services. The 2019 NHI bill uh, changes all that um, to mainly focus on appropriation. Uh, one through to NHI fund, who will then pay direct payments to facilities. And the other stream goes via the Department of Health to district DHMOs, district health management offices to manage facilitate supports and coordinate the primary health care services. So essentially, if you compare the two graphs, uh, it's quite quickly to see that uh, essentially provinces, um, uh, the, the provincial revenue fund is removed out of the equation here uh, for the, the for in in the, the uh, NHI bill of 2019. Um, so with that, um, and that will have ostensibly have uh, significant implications for the intergovernmental okay. fiscal relations system. Right. Um, so the the recommendations for this chapter, uh, first one is that the Minister of Health and Finance uh, should author, uh, should prioritize the development of an integrated national information system of patient and doctor registries uh, with real time data to inform healthcare financing and provisioning decisions using demand based costing methodology. There have been various uh, uh, data systems, however, they are ne never integrated and never real time. Um, so we're proposing here that uh, this this data system should be developed uh, right now and then pronounced in the and executed in the money bills going forward. Um, I shown uh, and then the second point, the second recommendation is regarding the a PHC package, which we went through earlier. The ministers of finance must ensure that in enabling policy, this is just to bring into light. Um, the issue around the NHI implementation and that it should be uh, the come discourse should or the discussions thereof should be um, it should be pronounced in the annexure one of the divisional revenue bill so that it can be brought to light and clearly in terms of numbers and figures uh, what this would do to the intergovernmental fiscal relations system. The fourth one is uh, to focus a little, uh, our attention on the issue of procurement, that it should be done not by, uh, uh, by, by people that don't understand the sector. Uh, the procure, especially on the procurement decisions and the issue around the benefits package, what it's going to cover, what sort of treatments and, and, and how much it should cost, it should be um, uh, uh, looked at by uh, the technical uh, committee uh, and then stopped by uh, health experts. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to um, Sasha Peters to take you to the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Um, as indicated, I'll take you through the last chapter of the submission, which is chapter five, and this chapter is guided by the sub theme of access to quality and inclusive social services. Um, if we move to the next slide, please, Jane. Um, so the chapter looks broadly at the area of family and community welfare services, and it focuses in more detail on uh, existing bottlenecks hampering to specific interventions, namely the delivery of early childhood development or ECD education services and progress with respect to rolling out inclusive education. Um, and we've seen during the unfolding of the pandemic, the huge gaps in access and delivery of quality basic services, especially to poor and vulnerable families and communities. And as we know, this is not a new um, phenomenon, but these are challenges which are long standing and uh, which need to be addressed. So just in terms of background or context, um, stable and supportive families have numerous positive uh, 
it influences on, on broader society. When families are stable, they contribute towards greater social cohesion and they make for more stable communities. Um, stable families are, are also more likely to be uh, associated with lower levels of crime, violence and substance abuse. Um, and literature also shows that when you take a proactive approach to strengthening um, families, so identifying at-risk um, families and putting in place appropriate support, that this is um, more cost effective, but uh, it also, uh, such an approach also allows the space for children to develop and grow to their, to their full potential. Um, as we know, the problem uh, that we face is that the majority of families in South Africa face numerous pressures from poverty to HIV and AIDS, substance abuse, gender-based violence, um, child abuse, um, and many, many others. Um, so as I mentioned, this chapter first looks a bit broadly at the approach that government employs when dealing with interventions focused on families um, before owning in on ECD and uh, inclusive education. So if we look at the next slide, um, this, this slide, uh, this first slide here relates to our first finding and concerns a general um, lack of a developmental approach to family and community welfare services. So firstly, family and community welfare services are very broad. Um, they range from the provision of free primary health care, um, uh, the provision of water and sanitation, subsidized housing, um, ECD services, um, inclusive education, and there are many, many other services. But ultimately, the um, Department of Social Development is the custodian of government's policy and program of action around families. Um, and what our analysis highlights is that there is a significant um, misalignment between um, government policy to strengthening families relative to what um, happens in practice. So in terms of the policy, the, the concept of developmental social welfare um, requires government to take a more proactive approach to identifying children, families and communities at risk. Um, so moving away from intervening after need arises to intervening before need arises and before abuse, neglect or exploitation of women, children or the elderly, for example, happens. Um, this as opposed to government getting involved after need arises and when relatively more expensive statutory interventions like alternative state care or protective services are required. Um, and the problem is that this transformation and shift towards a more proactive or developmental approach has been very slow. And it's been slow for a number of reasons, including our lack of funding. We know that departments of social development have seen growing mandate if you consider legislation such as the Children's Act, um, which placed greater demands on the department, but growth in funding to assist implementation has been uh, rather constrained. So there's been an overall lack of transformation in this sector. And the result is that our poor and at-risk families and communities are not getting the support they need to, to assist in breaking out of the cycle of um, social pathologies that characterize some of our poorer and vulnerable communities. If we move to the next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, speaks to our, the findings on our analysis of ECD. And I'd like to highlight four, four uh, key findings for the committee. And the first is that ECD education requires stronger prioritization and um, completion of the policy process. Um, so whilst we had the national integrated ECD policy approved in 2015, um, in the years that have passed since then, we know that the sector has struggled with implementation of the policy as well as funding. Um, and one of the big gaps in this sector is that the ECD policy has not been translated into legislation that clearly outlines accountability. Um, and as you know, government departments operate according to legal mandates, so there's an urgent need for legislation in this sector to be finalized. Um, the second challenge um, that must be emphasized is the need for more and better targeted funding to ECD. Um, so whilst we've seen improvements in the level of funding that is allocated to ECD over the years, 
um, relative to other forms of education, namely your basic and higher education, ECD receives a very minute part of total education spending, under 2% of the total education envelope. Um, given that this is the uh, form of, form of uh, learning that sets the foundation for further um, further learning, uh, we need to place considerably, considerably more um, resources towards ECD. Um, so there are two models of ECD provision. You get formal ECD center provision, which includes your grade R classes in your formal schools or pre-primary schools, and you get non-center-based uh, non ECD programs. And those are your more non-traditional programs like your informal play groups or your toy library programs. And um, our concern is that the funds that are being allocated are largely being allocated to uh, your formal ECD programs. And the challenge is that most of our poor um, learners do not attend these formal ECD programs. They attend the non-center-based programs. Now, in order to access the government subsidy in respect of ECD, these centers need to be registered. But in order to register, they need to meet certain requirements. And the problem is that to align themselves with these requirements, a lot of which are infrastructural in nature, they require funding. And these are funding that this, this is funding that they do not have. Um, so these are the programs that require funding the most, but which are unable to access them. Um, we do know that government has an infrastructure component in the ECD grant, which aims to assist these non-center-based programs to improve their infrastructure and therefore enable them to register. But it's a very small amount and it's not reaching all the centers that require assistance. Um, the third challenge in the sector is a data-related one. Um, for example, the sector does not have a data system that contains the number of registered and funded ECD programs and the number of children accessing them. There is also no data collection on the quality of ECD programs being provided. Um, so this is a big gap in the sector because to enable informed and sound decision making, you need credible, uh, reliable data. Then uh, the fourth challenge relates to ECD teachers. Um, and uh, when we look at the literature, the main predictor of quality for an ECD program is the quality of your teacher-child interactions. Um, but in South Africa, we have, it's estimated that under 40% of our ECD teachers have an ECD qualification. So this needs to be strengthened and, and, and improved. Um, if we move to the, to the next slide, please. Um, so this slide summarizes our key findings on inclusive education. Um, and as you know, inclusive education refers to a model of education where students with special needs spend most or all of their time with non-special needs students. So there's integration across the different types of school. And uh, it's not that all learners with special needs must attend only your special needs schools. Um, so in terms of our findings, we wanted to highlight three uh, which we think are key aspects. Um, the first is um, the inclusive education is characterized by a lack of accurate and up-to-date data. Um, you would have, as you saw with all the presenters, they mentioned the issue of data. The sector again is characterized by uh, data that is not uh, collected or reliable. There are estimates that place the number of children with disabilities um, that are outside the education system at just under 600,000. Um, and that there are just about 120,000 learners with disabilities in the schooling system. Um, so that means we are only providing um, education services to a very minute portion of, of, of learners with special educational needs. Um, so we need up-to-date and reliable data and without such data, um, again, it's unclear on what basis national and provincial education departments um, are basing their decision making on. Um, as with ECD in the sector as well, um, we have the problem of an incomplete policy process. Um, we had the education white paper, which sets out government's uh, 
what government wants to achieve with respect to inclusive education. That white paper was published in 2001. Um, it's about 19 years on and there's still no legislation to give effect to that policy. Um, so we need legislation to be finalized, legal mandates to be allocated. Um, so there's an urgent need to wrap up the policy process in the sector. Um, then the third, uh, and the problem with, with the lack of legislation is that it also affects the, has affected the development of appropriate funding framework. Um, so for example, learners with special educational needs that are based in public ordinary schools are funded in line with the school funding norms and standards, whilst there are no equivalent norms and standards for learners with special educational needs that are based in special needs schools. So again, firm legislation is needed to ensure a uniform funding framework for learners with special educational needs, irrespective of the type of school they attend. Um, and then the third challenge uh, relates to the need to adequately train teachers to assist in determining the special educational needs of learners. Um, so the more learners with disabilities, the more teachers a school should get. Um, but learners have to be classified as having special needs, and this requires that the school or the, the teachers assess them in terms of the policy on screening, identification, assessment and support, also known as the CS policy. And um, the problem is that many teachers are not trained in how to do this. And so you'll, the result is that your learners are not properly assessed, and then this has an impact on the provisioning of posts um, to properly uh, reflect the needs of, of, of learners. Um, if we move to the recommendations, the next slide, thank you. Um, there are various recommendations coming out of this chapter. Um, first, we recommend that to strengthen families, uh, uh, government should develop a three-year plan that identifies at-risk families and communities and rolls out interventions that take a proactive and developmental approach to strengthening and stabilizing families. Um, then with respect to ECD, we recommend a nationwide audit of ECD services so that we understand exactly how many early learning programs we're dealing with and how many children attend these programs. Um, also that ECD legislation must be finalized with urgency and that this must be accompanied by a time bound and costed implementation plan. Um, we also recommend that funding for ECD be strengthened but especially for your non-center-based programs where the majority of the poor and vulnerable learners are based. Um, further, that the restrictive registration requirements um, be rethought um, because we need a way of bringing your non-center-based ECD programs um, to bring them into the system so that they can receive um, funding. Moving to the next slide. Um, as indicated earlier, we know that Government is trying through the infrastructure component of the ECD grant to assist these non-center-based programs um, so that they can register, but funding in this regard needs to be strengthened. Um, and we recommend that the poorest uh, ECD programs, particularly those in quintiles one to three, receive greater targeted support focusing on infrastructure upgrades, as this will enable them to register and receive those subsidies. Um, with respect to ECD teachers, uh, we recommend that the Department of Basic Education, Social Development and Higher Education and Training prioritize the upskilling of ECD practitioners and develop a plan to professionalize the ECD career path. Um, with respect to inclusive uh, education, uh, which is the next slide, please. Um, we recommend similarly to ECD that legislation be finalized and that such legislation be accompanied by a time bound and costed implementation plan. Um, that as a matter of urgency, DBE together with relevant stakeholders can conduct an assessment of need. Um, and that to guide implementation of inclusive education, the DBE must develop a funding framework to ensure a uniform approach to funding learners with special educational needs irrespective of, of the school that they attend. Um, Chair, if we just move to the slide 50, um, which is just the concluding slide. Um, and this is, I think my chairperson mentioned in the beginning that 
Um, the submission has only touched the tip of the iceberg with, re with respect to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've looked at, uh, we focused on the challenges confronting largely the delivery of social services in South Africa. And um, we note that the challenges that we are picking up, if we look at previous work that the commission has done and the issues raised, a number of them are similar to what we're saying in our past um, submissions issues around uh, data, um, well-targeted funding instruments, etc. These are not uh, new issues that we are raising. Um, and then also just looking forward, the Commission is intending to focus much more comprehensively in its next submission on uh, uh, an assessment of the socioeconomic effects of the pandemic book. And uh, members will see at the, in the last two lines, the, the theme is noted there, the theme of our upcoming submission. Jay, thank you. I think that brings us to the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, with your permission, may I please hand back to Prof. Blykies? No problem, Ms. Peters. Go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson. You're so kind. Um, can, I, can I ask, uh, with your permission, if uh, the commissioners in particular um, Deputy Chairperson Michael Sachs and um, Kowani wants to add to what the researchers have told you, and then I'll make my last statement if you don't mind, Chairperson. Michael, are you there? I think for now, Chair, I, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kowani, are you there? Professor Plykis, I think um, Commissioner Kulwani just entered into the meeting. Um, some some people have been going in and out. Um, Commissioner Kulwani, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but uh, I'm okay. Uh, let me start by greeting the chair, honorable members, our own chairperson of the FFC, and everyone who's attending or on this meeting. But Chair, uh, I will say I'm content with the presentation. I don't have anything to add, probably maybe during the answering of questions. Thanks very much. Chair, Chair thank you very much, Chairperson. Just to, to make the point that when we spoke about the, the agricultural matters, it's not the issue about land. It's more the issue about how South Africa's agriculture has, has had a comparative and competitive advantage to many agricultural institutions across the, 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 the world and especially with regard to agro-processing. But what we also want to make clear is that, especially in, a, in an area like the Western Cape, there are great opportunities to start looking at localized product value chains and find ways to invest in, in those areas, particularly when it comes to food availability and food security to citizens. Um, and we think part of that is also to start thinking about social protection. Um, apologies, um, Professor Plykes. I'm just going to ask the, um, quickly if everyone can just please keep um, their mics on mute while the person on the floor is speaking, um, then it will avoid background noise. Thank you. Professor Plykes, apologies for interrupting. You may continue. That's fine. Thank you very much. So, so what we're saying is that there, there is a need to look at uh, in this report, to look at the, the greater role that that agriculture could play in terms of food security, um, food availability, and we know that that uh, the state, in particular also the provincial government, has as land available to help with 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 making sure that the children and communities um, and also the local economy. Uh, 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 grows within within the Western Cape. So all in all, what we're saying, this is the start of our inputs with regard to how do we see the role of provincial governments in particular in helping us to firstly to solidify, but also to build on social and economic infrastructure within the Western Cape. Thank you, Chairperson. And I'm yielding the time back to you. Thank you so much. Um, we're we're not in America, so you don't. There's no yielding of time. I own all the time, and I I give the time to officials and to members. <laughs> um, members, um, with that, I'm going to ask if there are any questions um, for the FFC. Now, I will take hands. 
Okay, I see one hand from Honorable McKenzie. Okay, Honorable McKenzie, you may go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the FSC and Professor Flakis and his team. I can see that he has been out of Bonneville a lot, because we still say Bonneville and not Bontyville. <laughs> but thank you for the presentation. And, you know, uh, Professor Plakis indicated that sometimes members ask the same questions every year. And I ask the same questions every year, because there's a reason I ask the same some questions every year, because it helped me understand if people, not necessarily Professor Plakis, but individuals, like he said, who just read the presentation and not read the full report in terms of the, the role of the FFC, is if they actually take this research that you and your research team has done seriously. Uh, um, and if the, the the people in power, and in this case, I presume, well, I'm going to say national parliament and and the president and the speaker, if they do take your recommendations seriously, because there are some recommendations or work that you've done that was done previously. I mean, a lot of the stuff are not brand new. Uh, um, and I'm going to start with the first question. In fact, that's the question I wanted to ask after Professor Plakis, uh, in because it will help me also understand my question in chairperson. The first question I would I would like to know is to given the the COVID nineteen uh, regulations, I wanted to find out if the FFC was classified as an essential service. Uh, the reason I'm asking that question because it will assist me to understand how was the research done by the researchers, what was the methodology used in doing the research. Uh, and I've seen in, in the report, they've spoken to uh, some municipality, they've interviewed farmers. Was it physically done? Was it done by visiting farmers? Was it done by telephone, by Zoom meetings? Uh, um, and that's what I wanted to understand, Chairperson, because it helps me understand my question into some of the questions I phrased. And if I can just, with your permission, just get, if it's not Professor Clark, if it can be the researchers, because there's a lot of questions I have, but it, it will help me understand. Uh, the, the the context and how I can ask these questions if I have an understanding as to how this research by the FFC was done. Can I just take clarity on that, Chairperson, before I continue with my questions, if I may? Um, is is your questions your extra questions based on the answer to your first question? Yes, because it helped me understand if it was desktop research, if it was physically somebody visiting the farmers, if it was done by telephone, because a lot of these things. Uh, uh, it, it does, in my opinion, will have an impact on the answers, the quality of the research, obviously. Okay. Andre McKenzie, what I'm going to do is I will take your first question. I would like to take other hands from other members, okay. and then I will do another round of questions so you can then ask your then questions based on the answer you get then. Okay. Andre Bonkondlo? No, thank you, Chair, and thank you to, to the presentation. Um, let me just uh, appreciate, I think, um, considering what the prof has raised, I think uh, we are inspired, uh, uh, prof, and I must assure you that we may not necessarily always have the ability to, to, to read uh, the reports you know, in, um, maybe uh, only live in the summer, but we really appreciate the work and we are inspired, I think, with your words uh, to actually check up and and, and read more the, the, the full reports than relying on the summer. I think thank you for that uh, feedback um, uh, to us as, 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 as members for also our own growth and uh, betterment in, in our work. Um, saying that, uh, the, the couple of things uh, I wanted to, 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 to check, Chair, is that I think I'm always interested and I'm happy the issue of the IGR um, a, a system is raised. Um, and um, being a, 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 a part, part of the system uh, myself, one just reads and tries to look at this thing at how can we better realize the the ideals that are set out in this um you know in the igr with the intention of harmonizing you know that uh, policy certainty uh, service delivery especially for a citizen 
Because I think for me, uh, in particular, what the constitution tries to provide um, in terms of the HR understanding the, the, the political system that we have is to at least uh, uh, create for a citizen a much more uh, harmonized uh, uh, system of government, uh, but also a, a better experience for that citizen in interfacing with the state without being bogged down you know, to the type of um, a political system that uh, that 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 we have and its differentiation, and I think in 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 practice it is not always the case, and it's actually becoming uh, more difficult. I think as we journey in, into maturing of our democracy, which I think is something as I was looking at this particular uh, element uh, in the report that uh, I'm, 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 I'm interested, I think, from somebody from the FFC, you know, who are outside, perhaps it's our own conversations also in our political parties of what would be the, the best uh, um, way of, of resolving this particular uh, a, 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 a challenge, you know, that we, we, we always have in realizing the, 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 the IGR. And I'm raising this because one actually experiences this in the main, sitting in the Western Cape where we've got a different um, a, a ruling party than what you have in the governing party and the level at which, you know, if one were to do, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a an evidence-based exercise, you know, both from the Western Cape, but also um, in comparison with the other provinces to consider, you know, the harmonization, if indeed, you know, it happens and what does the party political system assist or don't assist in, in realizing uh, such, uh, such, such, such harmony. The second part in terms of that uh, um, uh, prof and the team is actually, you know, the issue of, um, the capacity of the of the legislatures because i think with the expectation and the issues that are being raised you know um, um I, I i look at um you know some of the limitations being a member i think in the in, in the legislature and um, and i've i've actually uh, been exposed to the national uh, assembly with the um, you know the institutional support you know in terms of a budget office, you know, research and all of that. And I look at legislatures across, you know, and 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 for me, this is is one of the things that I am I'm saying in context now to trying to reorientate ourselves or the state and the in its systems, you know, post COVID of what could be those things that maybe we need to have a conversation amongst ourselves, you know, in enhancing. Because if you talk about just the simple, um, I think the comment you made earlier on, the capacity just for us, you know, as members to go through all this, you know, loads and loads and loads of documents, let alone the capacity that we have, you know, to process, you know, the technical expertise to process that sometimes, you know, it's a limitation in the, in the system that I think would, would shortchange the ability to, to make the, the, the influence. Uh, the, the other point is that I want, uh, I must support, I think, and I am very happy with what has been raised about, you know, how in the other countries, you know, how they've led their industrialization, which already, you know, embedded inclusivity. And I know, and I think with our history, we all know that was never the intention, you know, given <clears throat> the history of our country, you know, of the system, of the old system that you are coming from. And I Honorable Nkondlo, can you hear us? Honorable Nkondlo, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. No problem. I think okay. I lost somewhere after inclusivity. Yeah, you break oh. a bit. So. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. I, I was just saying that that uh, inclusivity, you know, um, has been demonstrated. I think if we look from the Mandela administration to where we are, you know, the various uh, or, um, um, uh, uh, economic growth that we have realized, even at a point where we had a high and positive uh, economic growth, uh, I think under the former president, Thabo Mbeki, they continued to be realities of um, inclusivity from the jobless growth that we had at that time. 
And I think this is one area that we're struggling with. And and I think I'm 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 happy with uh, I think the inputs that we one was listening to, you know, on how we can we can fashion that. And I think it's a debate that uh, also in the province we've been having about what is what should what is the theory of change in terms of inclusive um uh, uh, growth and i look at the local localization or localized uh, uh, production that you are talking about and i think these would be conversations that i think also sitting in the economic development uh, committees will have to fashion because indeed some of the challenge is the is the nexus you know that we have to deal with of the industry transformation and its appetite, you know, of uh, ensuring that, you know, inclusivity where my, more people participate, you know, in the industry and what should be the role of government in that or what should not be the role of government in that. And I think uh, this is also one conversation I would I would also like maybe some kind of um, a, 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 a bit of a, a delving into into such in terms of the role of the state uh, in, 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 in terms of that of that um, 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 uh, process. And my last one, uh, uh, Chair, is that I think in this thing, uh, I always struggle, um, and I struggle with this uh, particular sentiment of the infrastructure-led growth or foreign investment-led growth. Um, and I'm raising this um, uh, uh, to the FFC, you know, just for also maybe clarifying me uh, as a pedestrian on, 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 on these very complex matters, you know, that one of the things you know, I've actually, in just trying to follow and understand this, one of the things I've always been uncomfortable with the infrastructure or foreign direct investment-led growth, which I think talks to what are the things that we're doing before COVID that we would need to reflect on, you know, so that we do not repeat, especially now in the in the in the hurry of all of us of opening up the economy and what are the decisions that we need to take in terms of the economic outlook post covid one of the key problems for me you know in terms of this infrastructure led growth which is very important and i think the assumptions that are made there are always making sense but for me is always the result you know and i'm always make the 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 the, the, the the reference of results from a point of jobs that the 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 value if one use rents the value of money that is invested in these infrastructure led um, a, a, a growth initiatives versus the number of jobs that you would always um, a, a be told or informed of is actually you know the, the 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 gap is just so huge you will be told of a billion rand investment of a capital project but you will be told of a few thousands or hundred thousands if you may you know um a jobs that you would realize especially if you talk about full-time uh, employment and this for me is one one of those uh, challenges that I think perhaps talks about this inclusive way um, uh, of a, an economy that we need to realize. Because if we're unable, especially in an uneven development in South Africa, of our citizenry, how do you fashion that? How do you realize that? Yes, we do have those things and policies of skills and all of that. I'm just saying, practically, I think it's very good to talk about it at a high level, high policy level. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe trying to look at what could be those conversations that we can be able as a leader to fine tune when we engage with the executive in, 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 in that regard. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Nkondlo. Um, with with that, all the information you've given us and the questions you've given us, I kind of miss Honorable Murray today in this meeting. But to the FFC, obviously, Honorable Nkondla has um, asked some questions and made some comments. And Honorable Mvimbi's arm is probably sore from keeping his hand up for so long. But Honorable Mvimbi, it's now your turn. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I'm not going to be long. I think most of the questions in a way may have, might have been indirectly asked by Honorable Ngonlo, and I will wait for the answers when the FFC is re is uh, responding. But two or maybe three questions really, I have direct question. The issue of equitable shares. Uh, now, it's one of the areas that since I've been involved in uh, government, 
it's always been an issue right from the days when it used to be called intergovernmental grant and now it's called equitable share. There's always been the issue of the formula. I personally, I think I don't have any problem with the formula, but maybe every time when it's probably one of those issues, if we meet with national treasury, even provincial treasury, and maybe the, the FFC, it will be raised. Maybe if uh, the, the, the FFC might be privy as to what are the plans or move, are there any move to try and change the formula? If they are, maybe how far are those plans? Or also maybe what is even their views on the formula as it is presently. Then my second question is really on uh, chapter two of the presentation, especially bullet two. I know um, uh, Mr. Tang did indicate that if needed be, they will can elaborate on number two of chapter three recommendation. You know, it really deals about the transformation of the economy, especially structural changes into the economy. When you raise this at some other levels, people always the impression is created that you are speaking Greek or you don't know what you are talking about. And I think COVID-19 has actually exposed the need to restructure the structure of the economy. It might assist, as, as Mr. Tseng has indicated, that if it needs to be, they might like to elaborate on that, on the restructuring. How do they see the restructuring of the economy? The last question, Chairperson, is on the issue of uh, ECD, the presentation that was made. You know, ECD is one of those areas that uh, I remember when I was still involved in local government, nobody would want to take responsibility for when you raise it there, they'll say no provincial government, then the provincial government, they might also be a reason that no, we can fund it to a certain extent, or even some people will even refer to it as an unfunded mandate. But I just want to check, because if you look at on the constitution, on schedule, schedule B of the constitution, uh, it, it just talk about when it comes to local government, I know it talks about uh, the provision of child care facilities. Now, I don't know maybe what we might what might be the view of the FFC so far as the ECD vis-a-vis -vis the role of provincial government as the sphere or as one of the spheres of government. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Mvimbi, for your brief questions. Um, so to the FFC, um, so the questions you've received obviously was regarding methodology. Um, and essential services from Honorable McKenzie. Honorable Kondlo asked, obviously, regarding resolving challenges in the IGR system, incapacitating citizens, and how the political party system may hamper such procedures, as well as um, comment on capacitation of members in general and limitations in the systems. Um, and question from her regarding inclusivity in budgets, practices from other countries, and how to improve the growth theories and calculations, as well as the role of government in industrialization, clarification regarding the infrastructure-led growth and FDI-led growth, and how legislatures can reflect on um, the economy before COVID compared to now in order to grow the economy and jobs and the conversations one need to have with the executive. And Honorable Mvimbi obviously raised the questions regarding the provincial equitable share formula in terms of your view, um, how you see the restructuring of the economy possibly, and uh, your view regarding the role of provinces regarding the uh, implementation of ECDs. And I would just like to add a question from myself also um, as an extra to Honorable Mvimbi's question regarding the provincial equitable share formula. Um, it's obviously not the first time that the FFC has commented on the provincial equitable share formula. Um, previously, um, you also raised concerns regarding um, infrastructure and some of the calculations regarding infrastructure and implementation and monitoring of the implementation of infrastructure. And I just wanted to find out if there are specific categories within the provincial equitable share formula that the FFC would like changing and um, what, what are those particular changes that the FFC would like to see in the PES formula. 
And then after that, I will obviously take another round of questions with Honorable McKenzie going first, as he has follow-up questions, obviously, also based on, on his first question and also other members, um, depending on also how much time we have left. But Professor Plykis, I'm going to leave it up to you as to who will be answering which questions. Um, thank you, Chairperson and Honorable Members. Um, I'm going to be very quick, then I'm going to hand over to uh, the Deputy Chairperson, uh, Michael Sachs, to also manage the process from FSC going forward. Um, the problem with virtual meetings, it's, you, it's you, you, you guys never give us a break, you know, and if you're over the age of 50, there are certain things that you need to do, you know. So I will jump and come back into this BD. But say, let me just answer Honorable McKenzie's, uh, and I think Michael will answer the, the, the lion's share of the economic questions um, as raised by yourselves and also try to draw the connection with the Western Cape in, in, in particular. And then on the early childhood, I'll ask uh, uh, Sasso Peters to, to respond to that. But there's just two issues that I like to respond to quickly because I need to do it very quickly. On the McKenzie's question, and unfortunately we don't mention the uh, members' names in, in our responses, but I think he asked a specific one. The research that the FFC undertakes gets done long before uh, uh, it gets tabled into Parliament on the 10th of, or sorry, in the, the month of May. So we've been busy with this research long before COVID. Um, and, and there are a number of methodological processes that we follow through, and we've tried to, to instill a degree of rigor in the work that we were doing. But you asked more specifically on, on, on the whole agricultural question. Let, let me confirm with you that, that the approach that we were following was a combination of documentary data analysis and reviews, and those documentary data and analysis are, are documents from international institutions. Um, I, for example, the OECD, the um, International Monetary Fund, um, but also documents from, from the South African Reserve Bank, um, from SARS in terms of the data there, and um, um, and looking exactly at the patterns of, of what's happening in, 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 in particular on the agriculture sector. The second set of issues that we, the second set, the second point of regard methodologies <clears throat> is that I've been involved with the consultant that we've appointed um, in meetings with a number of private sector, if you can call it that, private sector farmers uh, in the Western Cape. But in, and as far as the Northern Cape, and we were, I was also boots on the ground with, with, um, with two of the, one of the researchers and the parliamentary liaison officer to talk to, to at least around 20 emerging farmers on, on the issues that, that affects them. Um, and so those companies that we have spoken to are ranging from as far as the Northwest to, to the Western Cape. And for the purpose of research, we don't mention these institutions in our research because part of our work is not to promote any private institution, but rather to look at what's the data information that we get from them. In addition to that, we've dealt with, we've interacted with government institutions, with district and local municipalities because the majority of agricultural institutions or rather agricultural farming happens in district and local municipalities. And we've engaged in a number of conversations with them from the Western Cape to KwaZulu-Natal, to the Northwest, to Mpumalanga, um, uh, discussing with them on, on, on that. We also dealt with it at the national level, Department of Agriculture, Rural and, and Land Reform, and interacted with national, the National Agricultural Marketing Council, um, and then a range of other forms of data sets to look at what is the comparative uh, issues that that's in the agricultural sector. Then we could tell you that the agricultural sector, at last month's uh, indicators, was the only sector that grew by 27.8% everywhere 
everyone else, every other sector has actually declined. So it is not um, only desktop because we, 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 we became acutely aware of that. And in the health sector, the same, and, and on early childhood, um, the same, and on special services, the same. And we've also asked technical assistants, people that specialize in these areas to provide us with technical reports. Um, so we commission some of our work out to these institutions. The other matter that I just want to get rid of, Chairperson, is it, it's not about the equitable say, formula. It's, it's a wrong conversation to have. The equitable share formula will always be there. It's about the division of revenue. How much revenue we have and how the cake gets cut between a number of areas. One, there are domestic obligations, i.e. paying debt repayment, um, issue around certain entitlement programs, and, and so on and so forth. That's the first call to the budget. Um, then the second is obviously the division of revenue um, between national provinces and municipalities. So you will always have a formula, is how you then look at what is the functions, what's the mandate responsibilities, um, service delivery obligations that each way of government is to deliver. But more importantly, and I'm saying this, since I've been left the Treasury to uh, politicians across the country, you, you cannot say that you are underfunded as a province, or health is underfunded, or education is underfunded, or range of services that you are obligated to deliver are, are underfunded. You can only do that if you have costed and priced your obligations the legislative obligations to deliver services, the policy obligations to deliver service, the administrative requirements around it, the service delivery networks, the infrastructure that needs to be delivered, and so on and so forth. Only based on the costing and pricing, then you will be able to see what is the service that's required, what is the infrastructure that's required, what is the administration around that that's required, What's the staffing issues around that that's required? And then see how much revenue you're getting. And based on that, you will be able to see where the fiscal gap is, whether there's a structural horizontal gap between the different provinces and yourselves, and whether there's a vertical gap between what is the obligation that you have as a province relative to the revenue that you have. That's the conversation that you need to have. That's the conversation that you need to ask your provincial departments your, national, your provincial treasury, to be able to see really what is the cost and price and the value that of the service that we delivered, what is the access questions to it, and what's the quality of it. And let me also just say, we're not doing this only to the national government, we're doing it to you yourselves. Because the national government will have its views, and what or, or very, very much happens is the national government, through the treasury coordinations, get the views of the nine provinces, and, and then with the treasury says, this is the view of the treasuries collectively together. What we haven't received, Honorable Chair, and that is part of the change that we need in the whole system, is that we need to have a view as to what is the Western Cape provincial legislature and government saying, independently of the FFC's recommendations. And based on that, we will then be able to know what do we need to monitor what's happening in the West? Okay. And that's the way one needs to deal with the division of revenue question. Not the equitable share. The equitable share is a, is a, is a mishit. It's a division of revenue discussion that needs to, to be held. Chair, with that, can I ask that I hand over to our Deputy Chair Michael Sachs to answer those questions, but also for him just to manage these FFC's uh, staff um, and I'll be back with you in the Jaffe. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, honorable members. Um, 
I think let me just make one comment uh, about the, the question that was asked about infrastructure-led development, uh, and then I can hand over to, to our staff members to reply. Um, so I think it's always important to remember that when we talk about infrastructure, there are two ways in which it, it can contribute to economic development. Sachs, apologies for interrupting. Could you move your um, video a little bit backwards? Otherwise, we're going to be looking into your mustache the whole time. <laughs> is that better? That is better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, there are two ways that um, uh, infrastructure can contribute to development. The first is um, uh, in an aggregate demand sense. So when we spend as a government on, on building stuff, we create a lot of construction jobs. And those jobs, uh, obviously, you'll pay wages and salaries to the people who work on the construction site. And that will feed into a, a demand effect in the economy. And that is welcome and good. But the reason re we really want to uh, invest in infrastructure is because the asset that is created through that work uh, improves productivity, makes it easier to do business in the economy as a whole. So, and that effect is much more important because the, the, uh, the improvement in salaries that comes about because of construction jobs is short-lived. It, uh, it expires once the contract is finished, and then you need another construction to keep that demand going. But the improvement in the productive capability of the economy as a whole, so if you build a new road, uh, it makes it easier for all kinds of people to do business using that road. That effect should be long-lived. Now, the problem that we uh, often have is that because we don't pay enough attention to the selection and planning of the infrastructure projects, we end up uh, building stuff that doesn't really add to the productive capacity of the economy. The biggest example of this, or, or the biggest example of where, where we've had problems, is around the ESCOM build program. So if you see ESCOM we spend hundreds of billions of rands building power stations, but the power stations are not able to deliver what we want them to deliver, which is reliable and cheap uh, um, electricity. So when we think about infrastructure development, we should always think about these two aspects. The one is the short-term boost to demand. That's important. But the more important thing is how much is this asset going to improve our productive capacity as an economy and that's much more important and and it's a much more difficult thing to get right uh, so with that i would hand over to uh our staff members i don't know who wants to go first maybe there's sasha and and chen and um henry so may, maybe henry is first um to to respond to some of the questions asked about the research Thank you. You may go ahead. The British Chair would assume you were talking to Shin. Sorry, Henry. I meant uh, Eddie, not Henry. That was the mistake I made. My apologies. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Ben. Commissioner Stats. I'll just speak to the question around the IGFR system and what is the best way of resolving this IGR or the achieving harmony? I think really the, the point we're making here is that the, there's really no need to reinvent the wheel because you've got chapter three of the constitution which, talk, which talks about cooperative governance and actually it provides certain levers through which such a system of cooperative government should be conducted. And we also have got uh, these other subordinate legislation, such as your IGFR Act, uh, such as your Health Act uh, and Education Act, those uh, legislation have got a system through which they, they, they 
they, they facilitate uh, IGR. The problem is in, it's in practice, what happened thereafter. Uh, so, so in our, uh, uh, our study, we find that the, the forums, which are really intended to facilitate harmony of the intergovernmental fiscal system are not really working. So your forums, such as your starting from uh, the, the 10 by 10s that happens between the provincial departments and the, and the national departments, your, your budget forums and budget concerts. I think at that level, there seems to be like, there seem to be some weaknesses in, in, in those forums that we think should be, uh, should be addressed just so that you to, to facilitate this harmony that we're really talking about. So it's not really to, to we're not suggesting that a new system of, of intergovernmental fiscal uh, system should be uh, reinvented, but instead uh, look at what is what the constitution already provides for and actually implement it and run with it and therefore to, to improve the, the harmony. So the changes that we'd like to see happening in the PES, as the chairperson said, but the, the the discussions around the PS sometimes most of the time we find that it really it it really causes you know back and forth arguments around which province is getting a fair share of the of the allocation and but the the really the 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 the, the discussion we're driving at here is that what is more important is to understand the expenditure needs of the provinces relative to the expenditure needs of the national government so that you can let him, uh, uh, determine the, the, the equitable share that is supposed to go to the province. Only thereafter, we can then talk about whether the equitable share is equitable or not. In fact, the studies that we've done uh, some years ago actually indicate that to a certain extent, the equitable share is more it's, it's actually much more equitable because we find that when you look at the capital allocation, the provinces which are relatively poor uh, receive high allocations of the PES. But because poverty is now uh, urbanizing, so we couldn't, we, we couldn't, we starting to see more poor people uh, migrating to the, the to the former or the so-called urban provinces. So it, it it would seem that the, the provincial equitable share formula is no longer equitable because uh, provinces such as Houting uh, take up and uh, take up a, a, and and even Western Cape to a certain extent take up a a bigger share of the equitable share. But to resolve that tension, that's why we're suggesting that we need to find a standard methodology through which we can measure the expenditure needs of the provinces, and only thereafter then we will be able to really establish with certainty whether provinces receive a fair share of the national of the national transfer. Or, or not, or the, the national transfer enable are, are sufficient. Of course, the, the funding will never be sufficient, but at least it would enable provinces to meet certain uh, uh, level of, of, of services. And that's why we are suggesting that the costed norm should be proposed, because that, at, at least that would enable the government to fund a province in such a way that uh, you, you measure whether you are you're progressively realizing uh, the needs as, the, as, the, as per the constitution. Uh, requirement. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think that will, those are the only two questions I'll uh, respond to. Uh, thank you, and honorable members uh, for the questions. Um, so first, if I may, very quickly, there's an issue around FDI, the foreign direct investments, and it, it actually um, came to the fore of the discussion that took place at the IMF. Should we consider FDI as a form of asset investment, or actually could it possibly, is it conceivable that it is actually debt, liability? And the conclusion of that, um, which ultimately resulted in the formula changes in the, the way that economists do, uh, do their balance of payments calculation and also the growth model is that they decided that FDI should be accounted as uh, liabilities. And this is for precise, uh, this is for a simple reason. It's because FDI, it's basically money that comes in temporarily for investments purposes, right, for whatever that may be, but with the expectation that it should result in returns. Uh, and at some point, um, if, however, that if a, the trajectory of an economy is positive, 
yes, that money should, could stay and grow further. But if not, then it could also result in capital outflow. So, so, so that uh, that essentially, in, in 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 a way, explains um, the dilemma, uh, and also what um, the earlier deputy chairperson quite correctly put in simple layman's uh, terms is that whatever resource we get, and from wherever it may come from, it needs to build towards the productivity. It's the productivity that matters. And if it's not product productive, then it doesn't really matter uh, uh, whether the money comes in in ten times its size or one times its size. Ultimately, it could result in basically investors pulling out. Um, so that is just uh, so. And then the same same notion could also be applied to how we see things such as a debt to GDP ratio, right? Um, and and of course the it brings in also the question about confidence, uh, the 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 rating agency, the credibility of the of our ability to uh, fiscal um, uh, ability to pay it back the, those debts. So it's um, it's that growth um, uh, uh, growth uh, theory or gro uh, growth uh, phenomenon that's. Uh, that, that is relating to FDI. Then uh, very quickly, I think um, just to reinforce what the, our chairperson said, equitable share formula. The formula, in, absolutely, actually, I just want to reinforce that with the, the simple fact that it, it's many, many provinces, oh, actually all provinces, they focus very, very much on the equitable share formula, uh, the, 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 the calculations and then so forth. Um, but I think it's important to note that and understand that equitable share formula ultimately is just data driven, and that the the issue is you even if you have the most accurate data in there, um, the result is that the phase in the delay so to speak, uh, the, of the response of the formula and the way that the division of revenue responds to the need on the ground. That uh, is the key issue here. So I might, may I just advise, uh, advise uh, members and, and, uh, and uh, this parliament that to focus a little bit on the how the formula is uh, phased in and then also to rise above it even to look at what is the pool, because as our chairperson is saying, it's ultimately it's one pool of money uh, that is uh, there, and then the, and then the decision around how that money is uh, divided uh, across provinces that is key. Um, before I move to then the, restruct, uh, the structural transformation, what do I mean by that, um, or what we mean by that? Sorry. Um, I want to quickly talk about the uh, methodology. The research methodology, just to reinforce again our chairperson's point, is that if you take the health, re the research on uh, chapter four of, around health, um, in fact, we use the data from uh, your Western Cape Department of Health. Uh, it's because this province actually has the most advanced uh, information system available out there. Uh, in, that enables us to conduct an empirical pricing and costing analysis um, uh, using the data that uh, that is within the province. So, so we'd like to thank you for that. Um, and also, it serves as an example of of uh, of that and proof that our research methodology is not just desktop, but also we went actually we came to visit uh, your department and also the hospitals. Uh, uh, to gather that information, and then it's in that vein uh, that that uh, that we conducted our evidence-based uh, approach to uh, making our our uh, research uh, uh, impactful. Now, lastly, uh, yeah. So, about uh, restructure, um, structural transformation is this. So, if I may again quote. Uh, the architect and uh, then leader of uh, modern China in the 80s, 
and the person basically responsible for uh, Shenzhen uh, uh, development, uh, starting from a rural farm village to what it is today, which is a tech giant uh, city uh, of China, Deng mm -hmm. Xiaoping. He he's once said that economic development is like crossing the river by feeling for stones under one's feet. So the in South Africa, however, I think with that humble statement, we need to think it's slightly differently and more locally. Um, and it's that first is we shouldn't think about industries or developments as, a, as a, in isolation or jobs for that matter, as normally economic plans targeting employment are never actually quite successful. Instead, we need to be more strategic and focus on this, as we say, the product value chain from the beginning to the end, from raw materials to intermediary, all the way to final goods, and think very clearly, how can we make it here, produce it here? Um, and if we can't, we learn it and we make it here so that we can create jobs. And, and, so, and second to that is that this approach, we need uh, information. This is the 21st century. We need informed decisions. We can't be feeling uh, for something, as uh, quite correctly uh, uh, by honorable members, that what is it? We can't be feeling it anymore. And we certainly can't be talking about it uh, too much. So, so it's time that we bring uh, the multiplier precision and predictive modeling with information uh, to, to, um, uh, to model this and to really know what we are transforming um, and, um, so, and so with that so for example take this COVID-19 for example shock that a certain product and services must just change and adapt and uh, to pack up uh, and to put it mildly in certain cases um, so like uh, so certain ways of tourism especially relevant to the Western Cape must change and that's how it changes um, uh, really is, uh, is, is, is that that thing uh, we need to basically think about how um, I want to approach this, that, uh, but with information and data to inform that, that, that transformation. Thank you, uh, Chairperson and members. Uh, Chair, if I may just come in on the question, uh, question by Honorable Mbumbi. Um, in terms of the roles and responsibilities with respect to, to ECD. So um, when it comes to ECD, um, responsibilities spread uh, across all spheres, national, provincial, local government, and across different, uh, various different departments like your social development, health and education. Um, in the case of national, the role is uh, more about planning, coordination, the establishment of norms and standards. Um, with municipalities, as Honourable Mbumbi pointed out, it's about laws governing your childcare facilities and more of a focus on um, environmental uh, health aspects like health and safety measures, fire regulations, etc. Um, when it comes to provinces, um, it's about registering, supporting and monitoring um, ECD centres and also partially funding the rollout of, of ECD through um, the provision of that ECD subsidy. Um, but I think what, as my colleague Eddie pointed out earlier, um, there are many challenges related to the rollout of services where the delivery is concurrent in nature. Um, so we are not questioning really the, the role of the different spheres or departments or um, the uh, provinces, but rather that we need government to improve um, its ability to implement services that require uh, multi-sectoral coordination. Um, we often see with such services um, where, they, where there's a need for, for many different departments and spheres to work together, um, service delivery will be characterized by frag fragmentation and kind of like each province doing its own thing. Um, so what we need as um, our chapter two points out is for our intergovernmental relation structures like your intergovernmental fora to be significantly strengthened to play the role they, they should be playing when it comes out to, 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 to roll out of um, concurrent services. Thank you.
Um, I are think the, uh, everyone is answered. I or? Think and uh, Plakis is uh, Honourable Plakis should be back now. In which case, I'd, I would hand back to him. No problem, Professor Plakis. Are you back in the meeting? Yes, Chair. I've been sitting here. It was quick. <laughs> I'm handing it back to you. It's your meeting. Thank you. No problem. Thank you so much. I'm going to take another round of questions. Um, I note Honourable Mackenzie previously wanted to ask some follow-up questions. Um, are there any other hands? Okay, uh, Honourable Nkondlo. Okay, so Honourable Mackenzie and then Honourable Nkondlo. Thank you, the Chairperson, and thank you to uh, the FFC and the team for the answers. Um, the reason I was asking that question because it helped me understand as to when the research was done, because things literally change on a on an hourly basis at the moment. In fact, both change on a millisecond basis, given where we are in in COVID nineteen, because we obviously received presentations from different organisations. And two days ago, we received the presentation from the agricultural sector. We received a presentation from Fedusa. We received a presentation from the Master Builders Association. Uh, given the current state we're in and where the economy is in. So it does, I just wanted to get an understanding. Uh, uh, and so who was interviewed? It doesn't necessarily mean the name of the organization. I respect their privacy. So who gave input into this uh, 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 to allow the, the FFC to come to certain conclusions? Because if one were to look at the NHI, for example, uh, some of the, the recommendations on the NHI, um, and because of the question I'm asking, if the NHI was effective the 1st of March 2020, it was implemented uh, where the health infrastructure, and if you look at what's happening in more developed countries like Sweden, if you look at how COVID had, uh, uh, decimated New York and several other countries where they do have better infrastructure than us, would, we, would it have made a big difference in this country? Would you stop? Uh, the inflation of, and, I'm, uh, and I saw that they just slide, and I'll get to the slide on the, uh, uh, I think it's slide number 25 or slide number 27, on the private sector price inflation, who did it stop those things? That's the question I'm asking myself, who did it stop people meddling in the corruption all the way to the top spokesperson's husband? In, you know, would it have made a difference? Would it have stopped the fusion center being set up in now dealing every entities now sitting, instead of doing the job, they're sitting dealing with corruption. Would that have made a difference? That's the questions I'm asking myself. And I'm giving a resounding no, given where we are at the moment, as of today. And that's why I wanted to know who was spoken to for this, to come up with some of these recommendations. Because if you look at your uh, agriculture slide, slide number 25, and we're going to slide specific, slide number 25, uh, labor absorbent industries. We had the, the, the wine industry, 25,000 people are losing their jobs at the moment. They lost 7.5 billion then because of the regulations. It was so draconian. Then they could to, to make wine. Then two day, nine days later, it was stopped. Then the total ban on transporting alcohol. People couldn't even harvest grapes, for example. So I'm asking how, so if you even, because it says on slide number 25, without labor absorbent industries, uh, um, uh, and the question I'm trying to understand, uh, uh, which brings me to my first question, has this recommendations, or is this recommendations, and I know you said we ask the same questions every year, and I'm, not, I'm going to ask the same question next year as well, has this recommendations to national parliament or to the presidency or to treasury, because you're dealing with individuals like Mr. Sess who's working in that office, have they taken these recommendations seriously? And is this going to impact the allocation of the budgets going forward next year? And I think that is probably the overarching question. And the officials at National Treasury saying, hi, former colleagues, or hi, the FFC, thank you for these recommendations. We're going to sit down with these recommendations or the ECD's recommendations uh, uh, um, on our supplementary budget coming in November or end of October. I'm not sure when it's going to come. We're going to take these recommendations, implement it in some of our plans. So a year from now, next year, things will be different. That is probably the, the over, I mean, we can go page by page on this presentation, slide number 28, 25, but that is the overarching question, Chairperson, because it's a slide by slide, we're not going to get a different answer. As these recommendations, or are you of the opinion 
that the recommendations that you've given and where we are today on the 28th of August and when the budget comes in two months' time, the recommendations that you've given is that what is the likelihood that some of those will be taken seriously and be incorporated in our medium-term budget and next year? I think that's the overarching question, Shepherds, because even if we go uh, page by page, that is going to be ultimately be how is the FFCRs, our colleagues in national parliament, and those are questions we need to ask our colleagues in provincial parliament, uh, taking some of these recommendations. It, use it. Uh, uh, because there's a lot of work obviously be done by the FFCs and some of the researchers and incorporate that into the budget. Otherwise, it becomes all your hard work that you're doing. It makes it meet. And then Professor Plark has indicated that uh, some of the things that we as legislators need to look at, and I just wanted to add, I'm not sure if the, the, the FFC do take a look at our municipal economic outlook, our provincial economic outlook, the Peru and Mero that we do every year, because those are the things that we say would be saying to an organization like the FFC, we, we are looking at it. This is what we need. And one of the other, other points that, that Dr. Uh, Professor Price rightfully made is do we plan and budget for it? Uh, and there was a discussion earlier on about the equitable share. And I can just one last practical example. If you take Tarthos High School in Mitchell's Plain, the classroom that's meant to be 40 learners per teacher is now 40, I think 47 learners per teacher. So three teachers are needed. Three teachers, let's say 10,000 in a month, 30,000 in a month, 360,000 in a year, 14, 15 schools in Mitchell's Plain because high schools, because that's the current situation, because there are overflow of 1,000 schools in the Western Cape. So you're looking at it at roughly, I'm just throwing a number, 200 million rand. Did the National Treasury say the Western Cape, 19,000 learners came to the province, yes, an additional 200 million just to accommodate those 19,000 learners for this? If that excludes the fact they're going to need a pen, a pencil, uh, uh, probably statistically 80% of them will be on the feeding scheme, so we need to allocate money for food. Uh, housing departments, they came with parents, so they need houses to live in, even temporary houses. So does National Treasury, or is National Treasury sitting down, or the FFC when they do the research, saying, yeah, National Treasury, these 19,000 learners that came in last year to the province, staff was a high, needs three teachers, they need a pen and paper, they need another classroom to accommodate these 220 learners. They're going to need two or 300 million. The Western Cape, based on the 1,100 schools, the Western Cape needs another 220 million rand only for the schools, excluding the feeding scheme, excluding the additional housing, excluding the upgrading of the roads that we can talk about in another department. And is that the level of research the FFC provide to the Treasury for them to enable them to make their decisions to say, listen, let's relook at the allocation of funding. And again, the F Equitable share. We can have hours conversation on the equitable share, but is that the level of detail and the conversations taking place with national treasury to enable them to say next year we're going to readjust fund not only the Western Cape. How things sitting with the same problem? Probably they probably need double the amount of money, three times the money with with us, and the bailing out of SOEs. We've seen the Minister of Finance talk the other day about 187 billion rand excluding guarantees, excluding several other uh, 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 um, indemnities given to SOEs of the last 10 years, or I think to 10 or 20 years, I can't remember, I think it was 2010 or 2001. But we have received no return on value uh, uh, for them. And is the FFC sitting down with treasury officials and say, how do we redo that for the next 10 years? Look at where we are, Danelli is totally where they are, SOEs, we all know where they are. We have not received value as a country for this. Let's re-look at how we allocate the next 187 billion over the next 10 years so that we can contribute to economic growth. Is that part of the discussion the FFC have with National Treasury? So that we don't in 2030, our children or our grandchildren, whoever's going to sit here, who's going to sit in Professor Flaky's place, can look back and say, hey, 10 years ago, those guys actually talked about those things. Let's, and they said, let's look at it differently. Is that conversation taking place with the FFC? Because that's the conversations I and our colleagues in provincial uh, uh, parliament need to have on a daily basis with our colleagues in provincial treasury and see where you allocate the money. Let's not look at now only. Let's look at the next 10, 20 years, 30 years. Because I'm just of the view, and this is obviously my view, 
that if the NHI was in place uh, a year ago, we would not have had any difference in the fact that individuals uh, had woodwinged the system and billions of rands, as we all know where we are today, special committees, interministerial committees on PPEs, that would not have made a difference. People would have still, still stolen. A thief is a thief. And no amount of burglar bars at my house outside here is going to stop any gangster from wanting to jump over the fence going to steal here. So that would not have made a difference. So what is the conversation the FFTC have with Treasury to enable us 10 years from now to have a different conversation as opposed to upsetting here again last year and next year asking the same questions? And I'm just afraid, in my view, that it's not going to be any different. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Mackenzie. So Honorable Mackenzie wants to know, who do you speak to regarding your research? Does your recommendations get taken seriously? Do you tell National Treasury you need five rand for pens and do they then give the five rand for pens, for example? And do you help change the conversation on allocations to SOEs? Honorable Nkondlo. Thank you, Chairperson. Can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you. Yes, Honorable Nkondlo. Uh, no, th th thank you, Chair, and thank you for, 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 for the responses uh, uh, earlier on. Um, I just have a combination, I think, of new questions and, 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 and the follow-up. Um, maybe just to, to, to start with the follow-ups, um, Chair, to close on those questions. Um, let me appreciate the responses on the, on the, on the IGR. Um, although I think mine was in, in no way, um, um, you know, trying to ask for a new model. I think on IGR, appreciating the current IGR, I think for me it was more from a results point of view, whether indeed there are there is evidence, you know, that demonstrate that the current IGR um, uh, system is working and if it is not working i think i was just pulling the one uh, as aspect you know of the current uh, uh, political system that we have and the extent to which it assists or it deters you know the functionality of those ig forums that i think are referred to and um, I, I would like i think the ffc if maybe they have done any study to this effect or they would direct one uh, um, uh, where one can be able to, to, to get such. Because I think the, the sentiment, as I was saying, in the constitution about that IGR to enable and fast track a service, service delivery is very uh, important. I think there is no question about, you know, such as an ideal. I think for me, the issue is indeed whether practically is it, it is working. And I'm raising the political system because at times, and I think uh, sometimes even our own debates would be victims as members, uh, you know, in this engagement or any other, and even in some in parliament, that at times our ideological framing you know, takes precedence um, than, you know, the practical or result-based, you know, evidence about what works and what does not work. And then you find, you know, um, policy implementation, you know, service delivery, you know, hamstrung now, you know, at a point of, um, you know, the different um, uh, lobbyings in terms of uh, those ideological posturing. I think my question was around that, you know, if indeed um, uh, all is well in terms of us as people that are supposed to be honing or oversighting uh, uh, the system. And I think um, uh, uh, further, further, Chair, I think uh, the, the, the discussion at this point in particular, I remember when we were part of the DORA conversation, I think in the, in the, in the joint um, uh, uh, finance in, in, in the National Assembly. One, I think there was a lot of um, um, uh, input, uh, which included SALGA you know, about what we have spoken about as a country. I think it's in the public discourse about the role of local government, because we all know that at this point we've got serious challenges in local government, but also in the local government. That is where, you know, the demands, uh, you know, of dealing with the structural problems of our country lies. And I'm just wanting to check 
um, at this point, you know, one in terms of the discussion of the equitable share or in terms of, you know, um, uh, uh, ability, you know, uh, to realize uh, full uh, spending, whether what what are some of the mechanisms, um, perhaps uh, in terms of FFC, uh, they've, uh, they've just suggested, and if indeed they are in the report, um, uh, I would I would uh, request that the colleagues in FFC may just uh, maybe refer me, um, you know, to that particular section um, and any other maybe information that they can share with us in that regard. One just would like um, uh, to engage uh, on that because I think from where I'm sitting, I think it's my uh, uh, view at this point that when you look at the three spheres of government and you look at where local governments sit, you always find this tussle between the national and the provincial government. Government. And I always, um, I think, in a in a pedestrian interpretation, see provincial government as more of a middleman, you know, or an agent, you know, that uh, manages um, where work must happen, which is at a local government uh, uh, level. And uh, ask myself a question of the relevance of this particular sphere in enabling you know, uh, services to arrive, you know, promptly uh, to a citizen and, you know, and ensuring that there's efficiencies in terms of policy uh, processes. And then um, maybe to, to also what um, uh, Member Mackenzie had raised, I just want to check, you know, having um, uh, once in my other life been part of a, a, a institution like a commission and um, uh, the work uh, it, it does, which at the time was not necessarily a chapter nine, but sort of a chapter nine institution. I just wanted to check what are, are the commission recommendations um, a, a, a binding, you know, I know at one point, uh, I think I think um, in one conversation, I think the matter was raised or, or, or sent back to us as the legislature that we've got a, a role, which I, I I think as I'm engaging more with the FFC, I, I, I appreciate and understand that role that we have of calling for the implementation uh, or actioning of those recommendations, um, which I think it's something that we need to build the capacity of, of doing. But I just wanted to know, um, in terms of the, the, the act itself or the legislation, uh, are the commission uh, re recommendations binding to the minister or uh, to, to, to the executive, um, uh, just to, to understand that from, 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 the, from the commission. And then the, the issue of spending um, in relation to the conversation on the on the on the equitable share, I always believe that I think the balance. Sometimes we discuss this um, uh, separately, you know, about what has been our spending um, uh, uh, behavior, you know, in terms of public finances. When one looks at monies across provinces of grants that have to be sent back or unspent, you know, and 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 all the other red tape that um, maybe provinces will be complaining about the delays, you know, in the in, in national to dispense uh, those monies, which hamper our, our, our spending patterns. And we see that more now, even during the COVID, that some of the monies that were put out there for the for the social relief, you know, for COVID, some of the monies could not be spent within the time that, that they had to be spent, obviously considering, you know, the procurement and the corruption issues that a member Mackenzie have 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 spoken to. I just wanted to check opinion from the from the from the commission, you know, around how do we circumvent or how do we arrest this particular uh, uh, challenge in the system. And um, my last one, Chair, is that on the issue that was responded to on the FDI and infrastructure, thank you for once again that education uh, on, on 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 that matter. I just want to know is that. Is there a particular, especially with the notion of uh, the discussion at an IMF level, is there any competitiveness um, a measurement tool, you know, around um, a, a foreign a FDI in particular? Because I hear and I understand and appreciate fully, you know, the, 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 the explanation that actually FDI is supposed to contribute, you know, to competitiveness. And therefore, for me, I would think there should be a measurement of before and after, before this 
these monies, you know, gets to be secured and invested in one's economy and whether you are able to see and what would be those elements that are included in that competitiveness, which I'm sure jobs um, uh, as one uh, element should uh, uh, should be there. But is there that uh, measurement tool, which I think um, we can also be able to utilize? Because when one looks at how much to date, you know, South Africa has actually, um, you know, um, led and tried to attract foreign direct investment, one will be interested when we look at our competitive uh, index or ratings. South Africa is always very low in terms of competitiveness, whilst we have always been one country, you know, since uh, the advent of democracy. One thing that that helped us with is to actually have loads and loads of, of foreign direct investment, you know, coming into our country. But I'm not sure whether there is evidence that points out to our um, um, increase, you know, um, invest increase of competitiveness of our economy in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Before I take the next um, two hands, I would just like to remind members that we only have until 12 o'clock to deal with this presentation, obviously, and to get all the answers. And some of the questions posed require some substantive academic papers. Um, and I just want to um, ask members to just try and keep their comments or questions quite brief because there's only going to be about 15 to 20 minutes for the FFC to be able to answer these questions, and we still need to get through um, a section of minutes um, as well. Um, I'm going to uh, note Honourable Bosman and then Honourable Mackenzie's hand. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I just wanted to ask, uh, based on the recommendations that's made on page 14 of the report, uh, Point two there, um, speaking to DSD considering a holistic package of family intervention that combines income support. If the Commission could perhaps expand a bit more on that and what that means and whether that's linked to the conversation around the basic um, income grant. And then point six around targeted support for non-profit um, ECD programs and the Commission um, uses the quintile system there. I just wanted to know if the Commission perhaps has an opinion on the quintile system or the poverty ranking at schools that is currently being used to fund schools and whether that system is working within the South African context. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Honourable Mackenzie. Thank you, Chairperson. I just left, left out the, the last two points. One is, on given the current uh, um, situation with job losses, and I mean, the, the middle class is severely battled. And I mean, I'm speaking from my own experience, my own family, every day in WhatsApp, you get people who've been on 60% of the salary, 70%, brother-in-law, sister-in-law lost, the, lost their job, company closed down, factory closed down. Has the FFC done any research in that regard and how current government policy is not assisting the middle class because every, particularly the, 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 the poor, we've got the 350 rand, we have the free schooling, but the middle class, where is the core? Where is the conversation with national treasury? And the last point on the agricultural land, uh, um, we rightfully we're not using a lot of it and we need to seriously have a conversation, including our own province. How do we do that? Uh, as you say, one of the slides for, for economic growth, but on renewable energy, if Again, bring me to my main point. Given where we are with energy situations with ESCOM and we're not going to be solved soon for the next 18 to 24 months, are they have the conversation with National Treasury government being, guys, sort out your policies on renewable energy, sort out your policies on this because it's stemming economic growth. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much. Um, Professor uh, Plykes, I'm going to allow you to indicate who will be answering what. Um, and I'm going to give you guys 18 minutes to deal with all of <laughs> the questions, um, not to put you under pressure. Um, for some of the thesis-like questions, um, try to keep them brief, or if you do have research, if you could perhaps then also afterwards, perhaps then forward that research to us for members as well, um, just so that we have 10 minutes left in the end to be able to deal with our business as well. Okay, Chair, thank you very much for the questions. Thank you, Chair Persons. We'll, we'll, we'll try to, to cut through the chase here. Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Michael Sachs to talk to the whole issue around 
FDI's SOEs gap in the middle because he's been also in part involved in that. Um, I'm going to ask Sasa to talk to uh, the DSD targeted support for ECT, but Michael can also cover part of it and the staff can come back into it. And also we'll talk about the, uh, the renewable energy, but uh, Michael can also reflect on that. I thought let me just cover some of the other issues. Um, I I just wanted to say that that I, I don't think we have corruption in the country. I think we pass beyond the point of corruption. We're now at the point of greed. Um, but also we we must just be also just reflect on ourselves and where we are located and what we do. Now we've contributed to this. The first time I heard about corruption was in 1976. Um, when my mother told me about Eshal Rudi and how he and a group of people stole the money and that was called the information scandal and when Eshal Rudi left the country. Corruption is not a new thing. It's been going on for years. Um, and, and, and in many ways, uh, even a conversation like this doesn't recognize that we found ourselves in a captured fraud F-R-A-U-G-S-T-G-H-T relationship between the political system and private business. And part of our focus sometimes is we're not looking at how do we actually break that whole, that fraught relationship between uh, public representatives at all levels, whether it's sitting in the provinces, whether it's sitting in municipalities, and, and, and at the national level, but also the administration um, officials, uh, given that we're talking here about public funds and public revenues. So there's a need to look at that. On the issue of the COVID-19, let me just be clear that we, the rules, we're not getting involved in the rules. All that we can say is that we, we, we know there's a human crisis, we know there's a health crisis, we know there's an economic crisis, um, and we, we actually glad that the people that's involved in the decision making around this are informed by health scientists within the country. Um, what has happened before COVID, this was an easy story to tell. What is happening during COVID and the, and the outlook going forward, there's a disruptive story to tell. No one else, no one, none of us know exactly where we're going to go. And that's why the need for, for precision modeling that cuts across all the facets of public goods and services on the one hand, or the administration on the other, but also how the the systems of government and governance need to be looked at. Um, I'm not even sure as yet as to whether we need a provincial legislature, national parliament, NC, the two houses of parliament, municipal councils, in the same way that we have in currently. Um, clearly, the, the disruptive force of COVID has to bring us to a new conclusive understanding as to how we need to deal with government and governance. On the recommendations, I'm going to say this again, Honorable McKenzie in particular, that question I must leave to you. Because it's not, it's not going to help us. You, know, you see the whole government, intergovernmental system is a, is a, if you just take the system's theory perspective, if the Western Cape Provincial Legislature agrees and approves or say these recommendations we approve of from the FFC, then it's incumbent on your treasury to take that position to national. And that national then needs to respond to that position that you've put. But the way the recommendations and reflection comes from the national treasury is that you all have agreed to the recommendation of the FFC, and that's the response that comes through it. And you can read in Annex W1, of the budget review, you'll see what your treasury has agreed to. Because in reality, that agreement is just an agreement and it doesn't go any further. So you need to be able to determine what are the recommendations that you agree with and what action that you want to see so that the treasury take those recommendations. The provincial treasury takes those recommendations forward. On the value of SOEs, um, I, I think we will, that's a long conversation that we're going to have to carry on over time, like the chair is saying. But I think just, just a reminder, there were a number of SOEs also established. Sometimes we take it for granted. I wonder if the members know that Vodacom and MTN were companies that belonged to the state, was established by the state. 
and just before 1994, MTN in particular went into private hands. Clear story to be told. How did that happen? Why did that happen? And who actually benefited from it? Because people say, argue all the time that privacy, we must give facilities to the private. The private sector must actually establish new economies. No, the state creates new economies. That's why we continuously talk about state investment in creating new economies. And the municipal outlook quickly, we have looked at that. Um, that's why some of the study that we've done last year on the municipal, restoring municipal finance uh, for 2020 division of revenue reflected on the Western Cape, uh, what the Western Cape is doing. On education and social welfare, social services, and health, I I've got a simple view here. These are, it's all our children. It's all our children. And their parents will move where the services are. And in fact, we want country. We shouldn't balkanize our country into a Western Cape, Eastern Cape, Gauteng and that. It's not people's fault that you, not you, are not only you that the negotiated settlement has worked in that particular way. I mean, Gauteng was built by every single person that has moved to Gauteng, to Gauteng during the years of the uh, discovery of gold. Gauteng was built by South African citizens. It wasn't built by people in, the, in Gauteng. Similarly, Western Cape was built by people that comes, came from other provinces. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's that whole thing about the national question about who we are as a nation. So what I'll take away from the discussion is that there needs to be a look at how the pressures on education, health and welfare services, especially in provinces of Western Cape, especially in Northern in uh, in uh, in uh, Gauteng and especially in KwaZulu Natal because there's also a, a flow over from people from the Eastern Cape and from Malanga when it comes to education and health services within those provinces. So so collectively, in any case, the national revenue is collected. It's a national revenue that's been collected for all of us. I agree that there's a need to properly cost our services. Hence, I made the point we need to look at costing and pricing. You need to ask the questions. It's not about the equitable share. And I'm saying it again, please, if you don't want to listen to anything that I'm saying to you, it's not about the equitable share. It's about the division of revenue. But it's also about how services are costed and priced within the province. Because services in Boatwood West relative to services in Cape Town, Cape Town, the service in Cape Town is cheaper than in Boatwood West or in Lanesburg in the Western Cape. And you know what are the input costs to that to make the services more expensive than there. So there's a need to look at inputs. There's a need to look at the issue of outputs. And yes, the outcomes is an important thing for you. So I, I think that 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 there is a need, there is a need to have this conversation over. Do we have conversations with the Treasury? Of course we have conversations with the Treasury. Of course, we have conversations with the provincial treasuries when they meet with the national treasury, and that forum is called the Budget Council, and it's called, it's called the Technical Committee of Finance. But I'm saying to you that if you don't ask your own treasuries these hard questions, it doesn't matter what you ask us, because our job, to answer the other honorable member, our job in terms of the constitution, in terms of the other law associated law is to advise, is to advise the provincial legislatures, all nine of you, all nine provincial legislatures, and the municipal councils and, and national government in terms of how we see things going forward. Chair, can I quickly hand over to Michael and then to, to Sasso to speak to some of those other issues of those others? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eight minutes left. I see Michael is Michael. Michael is gone. Is Michael still there? Eddie, do you want to Can I ask Mr. Eddie to respond? I think he's gone. Eddie? And Shane? It's, uh, thanks, uh, Chair and all the members. Uh, thanks for the second round. I mean, yes, so uh, if I may. 
the competitiveness index um, in relation to FDI and uh, basically um, all the other credibility index, if you like. Yes, there is one. And it's got to, um, obviously, uh, um, without uh, sharing with you too much in terms of uh, what it, where we are positioned and so on, because some of the research still needs to be done uh, with obviously the, the shock of the COVID in, uh, impact, uh, which will appear in our upcoming or the next annual submission. Um, is that the variables uh, informing that competitiveness index is essentially, as I said, the balance of trade. So inside balance of trade, there is uh, obviously the imports, exports. It has got to do uh, the total factor productivity within that economy. So basically looking at, remember that long-term graph not since 1960, that long-term trajectory of growth. Um, so it takes in the, into account of those movements um, and of course, uh, we are coming, we, we actually stepped into COVID-19 with a, a rather disadvantageous uh, position uh, because, I mean, we essentially were already in a recession and uh, go, entering into COVID, there's uh, uh, obviously more recession. Uh, 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 Apologies, Mr. Ten. I yes. just saw Honorable Nkondlo's hand is up quickly. Um, Honorable Nkondlo, is that a point of order? My apologies, I'm sure it's, a, it's an error from my side. No problem. Thank, um, Mr. Ting, you can go on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, so it's those, and if this uh, uh, parliament requires us, and which we are duty bound by the constitution, um, call upon us uh, to inform you and advise you in terms of those economic indicators and, and uh, to position to just uh, tell you, inform you of the way the, the South African economy is positioned and what are some of the weaknesses, external weaknesses, vulnerabilities uh, relative to the world, we are, uh, I'm sure we will be able to uh, accommodate that uh, going forward. Um, just in terms of the reason, um, uh, perhaps I was being too coy in earlier, is that the, and, and it's got to do with uh, um, also what our chairperson just said, about the engagement, the intergovernmental fiscal relations that needs to take place, the system of this parliament talking to the provincial treasury and then via that channel of IGR uh, to uh, national treasury. It's, uh, earlier I raised the issue about phasing. It's because the if you look back into your equitable share um, amount, Right, and then dig into, in this example, formula, uh, right? Uh, but not actually even the formula, but the mechanism after that formula in terms of the allocation. There is the three-year phasing, but recently, if you investigate it further, is that it's been elongated, it's been protracted, so it's been phasing even more, and then it's that conversation um, that. Um, I think this parliament, we advise you that you must engage with your provincial treasury and then raise that at the TCF and then the budget forum and the budget council to, to actually bring that into effect. And, and that will, we obviously, um, I'll hear you to advise you that there are these issues in terms of the divisional revenue, uh, the dynamics as per the chapter two of the annual submission, um, but it's, a, it's upon you uh, uh, the, to bring it uh, there at the technical level and, the, and some of it's obviously strategic um, uh, to, so that it lands there uh, at, the, at the national sphere, if you like, or the, in, in terms of that uh, division revenue procedure. Um, so I really uh, advise strongly, and this is my last point in relation to that, is that it, it's, it's significant. Um, because we've also been monitoring the conversations uh, throughout the past few years in regard to your education department. And there were huge changes, significant changes in your enrollment number uh, uh, data inputs in the, in the, in the uh, division of revenue um, uh, uh, formula, if you like. But, it, but it's that, and, and, and I don't think that um, the you uh, the the if you want to really see impact 
um, that uh, that is a particular issue to have to sh that should have been taken upon uh, uh, to uh, to to really resolve some of the dissatisfactions perhaps you have with the equitable share. Um, so I, I really uh, think with that, um, uh, I, sh I think uh, yeah, uh, Sasha, if you want to take over in terms of the ECD and other social development uh, issues. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, so uh, Honorable Bosman, the recommendation focusing on families is not linked to a basic income grant per se, um, but rather it's calling for a stronger focus in terms of funding or priority uh, to be allocated towards more uh, proactive or preventative um, family strengthening interventions. The problem that we have um, now is that the majority of interventions that the Department of Social Development um, uh, undertakes or where most of its money is going, it's focused on statutory type interventions as opposed to these more preventive um, um, interventions. So we are saying let's find a better balance between the two. Um, we know that these statutory interventions are urgent and that you know we need funding to be directed there as well. But we need to also start uh, prioritizing interventions that strike before a need arises. Um, yeah, so I think that is on that one. Then with respect to the, the quintile system, um, we know there are issues with respect to the, the quintile system. For example, in the Western Cape, they may a number of le poor learners sitting in quintile four or five schools, or there are challenges with, with, with inaccurate ranking of schools. So there are those constraints. Um, but I think yeah, with respect to the ECD, what we are calling for is that as a, as a first um, step to bring into the funding system or into the fold those ECD centers that are currently not accessing any um, subsidies and where the, the majority of the poorest learners sit. Um, so as a first step, utilize the system that is already there. It may assist in, in us more quickly um, uh, reaching or getting funding to the poorest learners. Of course, this is not to say that we don't need to work on addressing the challenges with the current quintile system um, and the way that it ultimately ends um, up targeting, targeting funding. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Ms. Peters. Um, is there anyone else that still needs to answer questions? Chair, can I just say that, um, because I see you're running out of time here with us, that the the effect of the in, uh, foreign direct investment um, and how that works, we haven't done that, because that's part of the, the thinking that we're starting to look at when we look at um, the MTVVS in relation to investments, where it goes and what happens to that and the multiply effect if there's a, if that's if that's there at all. Um, because they, that's a little bit of an area which is uh, information are not easily available around that, uh, even if we sit in a space of government. On the SMEs, I think the, the, the key thing that that we're starting to, in any case, pick up is a need to review the standing of SOEs within the country. Um, uh, in fact, I'm not so sure whether we need SOEs in provincial governments across the country uh, 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 because we find them sometimes as a, a black hole where money goes in and we don't see the, the productive uh, outputs that those institutions are doing. Um, there are concerns around the energy, uh, transport and other SOEs. Um, we, we don't know what's going around there because all that we know is that there's a committee has been set up to deal with those issues and hopefully we will be able to learn from them. The point that Honorable McKenzie makes about the gap in the middle, we agree. Um, the gap in the middle hasn't started only with COVID, by the way. It started also with, with uh, the lack of financial investments that, that uh, has been made by the state and the cost slow growth of the economy, the whole issue around um, um, on debt service cost. Uh, borrowing levels, uh, the downgrade of the of the South Africa. So we've seen a slippage there. Um, what interventions need to be taken? A uh, simple view for now. Let's start looking inwards. Let's recognize the global economy. Let's recognize that we're part of a global economy. And let's start inter 
investing investing in local fact in local value production. Let's look at our own economies and see exactly how we how we can create the um, economies within our own environment so that we can actually help our communities, our citizens from the shock that they've experienced out of COVID. The poor is getting poorer. The middle class, many of people in the middle, lower middle class is slipping into poverty. Um, and we're not going to get out of this over the next 18 months. So we need to start thinking quite differently. The point I'm making, you can't be asking us the same, this, these type of questions any longer. We need to ask the questions that really matters for the citizens that we serve. It really matters for those households, for those communities where those children and those families are living in abject poverty, whether they're in urban or peri-urban or in rural areas. What do we do collectively? That's the key question that we need to ask. And that's the only way we're going to be able to deal with these problems, because it's a lot of problems. And I'm saying to you that before I get misunderstood, I think we've moved away from corruption. We had a point of greed. It's gefreed. It means it's gefreed for still. And it's what else I was okay seeing. So we need to think about those type of things and start finding the solutions. It can't be just the politics any longer. We need to find solutions for our citizens. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Professor Pleikis. Um, and thank you so much for the FFC for presenting to us today. It's a lot of information. The report is quite a bit of bedtime reading, as I always call it. And I hope that members and the officials will go through the report in order to familiarize themselves with um, the recommendations of the FFC. Thank you so much. You are excused. The members are going to continue with committee business now. No problem. Members, if you could please just stay online. And I've noted Honorable Bosman needs to be excused from the meeting. OK. Um, Ms. Klute um, and Ms. Ahmad, if you could perhaps just um, put the, the minutes of the meeting on. Uh, members, I'm going to first deal with the minutes of, of the that we need to adopt before I deal with resolutions. OK, members, so you'll see there the 28th of July. If we can just um, go to see if our names are there for the 28th of July, you can go down. Yep. OK, we can go down. You can go down, that's page one. Let's go down. That's page two. If I could have a mover of the minutes, if there are no edits. Going I once. Move I move. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable McKenzie. Is there a seconder for the minutes? Chairperson, uh, I was not at the meeting. Can I second? Um, no, unfortunately, you can't second okay. if you weren't at the meeting. Can I However, um, it's. Thank you, um, Honourable Nkondlo. Uh, perfect. Members, with that, the minutes are adopted. Are there any resolutions um, from members for this meeting? Okay, if no resolutions, yeah, members, yeah. Honourable yeah. Mvimbi, yes? Check whether we'll be in order if we can take a Inviting Honorable, Honorable Mvimbi, just hang on quickly. I'm going to quickly mute everyone and then I'm going to ask that Honorable Mvimbi ask his, unmute himself to ask his question because otherwise I can't hear what the members are trying to say. Honorable Mvimbi, please unmute yourself. Thank you. you. In view of this uh, very constructive and productive discussion we had with the FFC, is there no way maybe we can re-invite them? at the time, because most of the time we seem only to be having only once off discussion with them once a year. And I think maybe if we can at a time where there is, can be even enough, for example, the chairperson said that if we can look at their recommendation and indicate uh, which recommendation do we support or even the, our departments uh, via treasury, what they support and so on, we can have a, 
a way of having to make some of their recommendation effective. I was just thinking maybe is there no way we can say, look at a time where we can re-invite them and look at some of the recommendation that we think we'd like to further engage with them. Because I think I find their discussion with us very constructive and productive. Thank you, Honorable Mvimbi. Um, I think it's a good idea to invite the FFC back. I was actually thinking of rather doing a workshop with various institutions in order for us to understand their mandates and how to deal with particular finance and uh, legislation and matters and budgeting matters. Um, but before we we go to that resolution, um, Honorable McKenzie, I saw your hand. Is it a new resolution or is it on this matter? On this matter, Chairperson. Okay, Honorable McKenzie then. I'd like to second that actually. <laughs> Uh, that we do invite them back, please, because yeah. And then on that resolution, if we can get a report, and I think the chairperson spoke to that report on the, if I think it was the effectiveness or the discussion around the sustainability of municipalities, one of his answers he raised that if there was a report done on it, or if it's just his opinion, I'm not too sure. I can't. If if any member can uh, remember, if he said was it the report or was it just his view. Okay, in terms of the first part, um, I'll, we'll add that to Honourable Vimby's um, request, which we'll go to now, just waiting for everyone. Honourable um, Nkondlo, is this on this matter? No, thank, or you, any matter? thank you, Chair. I'm supporting the proposal and I wanted to ask, given I've always uh, seen uh, in the past few days, that FFC will always um, be with the budget uh, office presentation, you know, uh, during the budget processes. Now that we are still in our own process and we do not have that particular budget office, I wanted to ask whether is it possible indeed, uh, especially because they say they engage with our provincial treasurer, that when we are about to do our engagements on, on, on budget, whether it's budget estimate or, you know, a new budget for the new financial year. Is it possible? Because they say they've got a mandate to also service us and we do not have provincial FFCs that we can then invite them either before or with, with that meeting on provincial treasury, because I think they are valuable in information in terms of the where they are sitting as a financial commission is very important in giving us just another view on, 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 on financing and how, um, you know, public spending is done. Thanks, Chair. So I wanted to ask whether that beyond just the meeting that is being required, is there a way that we can be able to have them standing as part of discussions on, on specific budgets, budget debates, actually? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we can invite them for every single budget debate, but maybe in committees and when the budget is presented, we can ask them if they have any particular views on any particular of the of the votes within the province, because they they do have a mandate to be able to advise provinces on financial and budget matters. Um, so. I think that the suggestion is actually a more comprehensive one that I'm hearing from respective members, that we invite the FFC back in order to engage them, um, especially on the topics of provincial budget, on um, their recommendations, and possibly even inviting the provincial treasury regarding their view on the recommendations of the FFC, as well as um, whether they have can forward us the report on sustainability of municipalities, which they mentioned, or um, if they have a particular view regarding the matter and budgeting, if they do not have a report. Members, are you happy with that? Perfect. Yes, maybe? Yes, okay. Agree. Agree. Thank you, members. And with that, are there any other resolutions? Chairperson, can I perhaps also add if we can in we know that the budget process is going to use this underway we're waiting a national and they can't touch but i would like to hear from a provincial treasury on the budget process to determine what's coming at the end of october what are they currently doing what are they taking into account have they met with the municipal offices uh, have they met with the municipal spending patterns the last three months during COVID 19 provincial de department spending patterns. So when the report eventually do come to us end of October or 
November uh, uh, with the medium term adjustment process, at least one have an idea what was done to get them where they are in November. And I th think that will be keen to see. And it'll be interesting. It'll be nice if the FFC do their report on that same day, because then one can see exactly what also informed our provincial treasury. Um, it'll show us a kind of a trend because Prophet Parky did say something interesting. Obviously, that we need to speak to our provincial treasury to see what they take into account or some of the recommendations they take into account. So it'll be interesting to see if both of them are there in the same meeting and to see the different presentations and see if they are aligned in their thinking or in the methodology to see where we're going with the budget towards end Feb next year or end of the financial year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, members, um, I was actually previously speaking to the procedural officer about actually even having a one or two day workshop with the budget committee and finance committee possibly jointly on various finance and budgeting processes and matters on how do we read certain stuff, how do we understand certain processes and so on. And I would like to ask, is it possible for you to to rather than maybe mandate me to go and look maybe for a day or two, it may, for example, fall on a constituency day plus a Tuesday or perhaps a Friday and a Saturday, where we can try and see where we can put various workshops on how to understand particular procedures and particular mandates, because I think that will actually assist us before the budgeting period. Um, how do we read the budget? How do we understand the budget? For example, the Gender um, Equality um, Commission, for example, said that they could come and speak to us on how do we do gender-based um, budgeting? And how do we view that in the context of how the spending occurs? How does infrastructure spending occurs? And I think that all of these big questions that we have are things that we, we need to unpack possibly before the budgeting um, procedure begins so that when the budget comes to us, we are able to understand um, and ask the, the more appropriate questions that, that we should be asking. And I want to want to find out if that would be okay with members, if I can go and look for possibly two days um, where we can try and slot these various, com uh, not commissions, but workshops in. Chairperson, supportive. Thank you, Honorable Mvimbi. Support. Thank you, Honorable McKenzie. Uh, members, are there any other resolutions? Chairperson, sorry. Yes, Just on McKenzie. that. The Western K, I said the National Parliament has got a budget office. Uh, and I know that they have done presentations to the National Finance Committee and the National Parliament. Uh, uh, if, if you just, on, I mean, even if you just have a, co a conversation with a chairperson of finance in Parliament or anyone in Parliament for the matter, and just get an indication if there's a willingness from that budget office, uh, uh, because they take MPs through the whole process, if they can do just a presentation even. Thank you. Okay. I will engage the National Budget Office as well, whether they are able to do a presentation to us in general on budgeting. Um, and what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to ask members if you have specific ideas for workshops or general presentations that we need to do. I'm not talking specific on votes because the budget will obviously come to us, but on general things that we need to understand on how to do budgeting and how to read budgets, understand budgets, if you can please email that to the procedural officer and or myself so that we can try and look where the general themes are, which members would like, and we can try and, and slot that into a one or two day workshop perhaps, if members are okay with that. Perfect. Happy? Okay. Members, with that, I'm going to assume that's the only resolutions we have today. Um, thank you so much for staying online. I know we've gone seven minutes over time. Members, I hope you have a lovely weekend. Stay warm, stay safe. Meetings adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.